you know, you can get away with very little infrastructure on a farm. And sometimes when people, especially when people, like, so if you've been talking to Curtis Stone or Jean Martin, you're going to come to a different perspective at the beginning. But a lot of people come in and right away they think, I got to get a, I got to get a tractor, maybe a cultivating tractor, I can get on top of weeding that way. And what I think, the, so you do need a way to, tr to work your soil. Now, if you're in some kind of no-till system that you're not going to turn the soil and it's working, well, that's great, fantastic. But if you don't have something that works, you will need some kind of rototiller or some kind of structure thing. And it could be a BCS walking track, and that can work really well. But where I think it really makes sense to invest is in your post-harvest handling. And um, so you want to have a wash station that is sanitary. <laughs> also, that's out of the elements so that you're not miserable like in a rainy day or a windy day. Um, so that, that's important. Um, and then I would say a cooler, some way to cool your vegetables is really, really vital. And s for the simple reason that um, when you harvest, so you should probably harvest your crops as early in the morning, at least the tender ones like leafy greens. So, because if you wait, harvest them too late in the day, they have a lot of field heat in them. And that's, once you cut them, they're going to wilt a lot quicker. So if you harvest them earlier, you have less field heat. But in the summer, there's still some heat. So you want to get them out of there, dunk them in water to hydrocool them, and then bring them out and get them into a cool room. And store them for like a number of hours, up to like 24 hours before you're going to market it. And there are people who love to say, this was freshly harvested this morning, and it's getting right to you. But I would argue that crops that have been well conditioned Will, do way, will store well, much better for a client at their house than something that's just harvested quickly and sold the same day. And so that in, that, in that cold chain, keeping things in the cool room for a while, it really stabilizes the crop and it's gonna really extend the storage life uh, of your crop. And, um, and, 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 I and I do know some great farmers who have minimal cold rooms, but I think that's, that's the exception. And, um, and you could just have a fridge or something like those, you know, like those Coke coolers or something, um, but nowadays with um, this is the Coolbot. I don't know if you guys anybody not know about a Coolbot. Okay, so a Coolbot um, is a um, a little computer that you hook up to an air conditioner, like sort of normal air conditioner or like a heavy duty air conditioner, and it will override the contr the controls so that it'll lower as opposed to like tapping out at 16 or 20 degrees. You can bring it down to four degrees and it'll, it'll maintain that temperature. So the cool bot's a few hundred bucks, the air conditioner's a few hundred bucks, you get into some kind of room that you can be built pretty, pretty, pretty shoddy if you want, and it's way cheaper than any professional cooling system. And like when you're dealing with an evaporator and compressor and you have to deal with the refrigeration guy, when that guy comes out, it's a couple hundred bucks when there's no problem. And when there's a problem, it can be like a thousand bucks. So a cool bot, th there's, it's a very cheap investment for the amount of return it's going to give you. Um, so that's so I would say um, some kind of cold room is really, really a good investment. Another thing to really be careful about is if you choose to not go with irrigation, and there are great growers not irrigating, but if you're in a climate that has periodic dry spells or constant dry spells, irrigation is what's going to make your stuff germinate and is going to give you a control over the crop that you might not have. Even if you're like, so we're, you know, we're at Montreal above the northeast U.S., which is a fairly wet climate, but you can have three weeks of dry weather. Even if it's like a flood year, you suddenly have three weeks of dry weather, things get warm, you seed salad greens, they take an extra week to germinate, and it's an erratic germination, and then suddenly you don't have your yield that you're looking for. So irrigation is another thing I would think about, and then you, know, you have to have a way to, to till your soil. And those three things don't have to cost a lot. So... Um, and everything else, um, you know, it's just for fun. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it isn't. So at this point, I'm going to jump into the presentation. And um, I'm going to start off with sort of a bit of an introduction, introducing myself and, you know, kind of some ideas. And then I'm going to jump into a more structured crop planning approach. And I'll talk about that approach when I get to that point. So, um, and I'll, I'll also highlight in the um, in the, in, the, in the the proceedings or the, the the schedule, the title was crop planning to kick ass. Um, that was my working title. It wasn't supposed to be published. 
<laughs> and uh, when I saw that, I was like, oh, I guess I didn't correct that. So I'm just going with crop planning for organic vegetable growers. And um, if you're not certified, you can still use these, these methods. So a little disclaimer. Um, so I'll start off with what makes a great farmer. And you hear that, like, this person's a great farmer. And sometimes I'll hear, you know, this guy, he grows the best vegetables, he's the best farmer, but he just can't make it work, and he had to close shop. And what I would argue is that, you know, if you can't make a living farming, you're not a great farmer. You might be a great grower, but farming has, like, when you're talking about farming, um, unless it's pure homesteading, business has always been part of it. And people have been making business decisions in farming for hundreds of years, um, as probably as long as agriculture has been in North America. Um, and people are planning since the beginning. And so it's, to, to be a great farmer, you have to wear a lot of different hats. And the business side might be even more important than the growing side. Um, and um, so it's kind of a little thought to seed there. And so, over this weekend, or this, this conference, there's been, you know, they've had a number of examples of different successful farmers. You know, there's Chris Thoreau, who has a very small surface and a high turnover of microgreens that are there for a few weeks. Um, Curtis Stone is a third of acre, doing something like eighty-five dollars or $100,000. Jean-Martin Fortier, and I, I had his wife, Maudelaine Desroches, um, who's a really impor as important part of the, pro the process as he is. Though I'll refer to Jean-Martin by name throughout the rest of the talk, but that's kind of assumed that you know, the couple is part of that. Um, and they're at you know, an acre and a half, and they're doing something like $150,000. And um, you know, I remember when Jean Martin was first being really successful with his model, he's looked at a, really, a micro farm, a really small farm. And now in this list, he's the giant. And we're growing seven acres of farms, <laughs> of vegetables. So like, we're off of this. And, um, and these are all successful farmers. Um, I like to think we're successful. I'm not going to say we're the great, but. Uh, and there's a lot of things that these farms have in, have in common. And um, one thing is these, these models are really appealing because it looks like not a ton of work and it's a good return and it's a good lifestyle. And I'm not going to dispute that, but I, what, I, what I will try to make a case for a bit in the beginning is that there's other ways to farm that can also be really rewarding in terms of quality of life and, and finances and it being ecologically sustainable. Um, and um, so if you see yourself straying from this model, something that's different, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, doesn't mean it's going to work out, but it, might, but it can. So in the case of these farms, they all focus on high profit crops. This is one, one of their secrets, is if something's not a high profit crop, why grow it? And Jean Martin might be a little bit less than that because he's, he's dealing with a CSA and has to have a broader range. And I would say ourselves, we, our high profit crops might be like a quarter of our crops. It's not the bulk of it. Um, and then these guys have all smaller acreage and I've kind of addressed that. Um, they have low overhead and in infrastructure and we've kind of talked about what that infrastructure can kind of look like. Um, and one thing that I've been arguing with Jean Martin all weekend about is he would highlight they have no tractor. And this is something that, um, that he, he sees quite a bit. But, we have three tractors and a cultivating tractor, and there's a lot of good farms that have them. So I'm not going to put a big emphasis on this, but there is definitely, once you do have a tractor, there's a tendency to get more gear for it, and there's a lot of more expenses that come along with it, and a tendency to scale up maybe beyond what you're able to cope with. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a reason that like Amish farms choose to not use tractors and they're using horses. It's to kind of keep the scale at a community level and not have individual people getting too big. And um, as you get too big, there's a lot of, I mean, other than community problems, there can be, there's a lot of issues that come in of, of dealing with your market. Um, but I'll just scratch this from the list for the moment. They tend to have low labor, especially low hired labor. Um, and they're focusing on you know, a few highly skilled key individuals. And, um, and I think this in some ways is one of the secrets of these operations, is that you have somebody who fully understands your system, has great work ethic, and is able to do stuff you know, from start to finish. And that means that you're not training a bunch of people who don't really know what they're doing or have a bad work ethic. But this also really scares me in that, what happens if that person gets really sick? What happens if that person has a family emergency and has to leave for a couple weeks or, or more? And it, this, th it's, 
Now, there are small farms that can deal with those emergencies, but it's something that you will have to deal with if you lose those people. And it's something in our farm, we have five farmers running the farm, and we have seven employees. Um, so there's a lot more resilience in not relying on individuals. And, uh, and I think on the medium and long term, that can help the sustainability. Not to say that this is going to be the kryptonite for these guys, um, but it's something to be aware about. Uh, you're, you're, it's, it's what you're betting on. But the last thing, this is what these farms all have and is the real secret, is they have systems. So they have an approach for everything they do on the farm. The, for each crop, they know when they want to plant it. They know how that process is. They know when the bed prep is going to happen. Um, they know how to deal with clients. They know how to do invoicing. They know how to do all the crop planning, which we'll be talking about. And it's those systems and following those systems that's the magic in this. Um, there's a lot of farmers out there who know that you have to have good invoicing systems or know that you have to pr plant into nice prepped soil or a, you know, a nice seed bed. But when it gets time to plant on that seed bed, their beds aren't always ready. And it's those systems that make it happen. And that's what um, I'm going to be kind of trying to talk a little bit is what some of that system looks like on the planning side. I'm not going to tackle a lot the bed prep and some of those other things, um, but I'll be talking more the, more, more the planning side. But if you do want to have a fantastic farm, it's those systems that you want to invest in. Um, and sometimes it takes time to develop them. <laughs> But there's a lot of great models out now, and um, I, I think that young farmers and new farmers and even older farmers who are established and <laughs> want something different are really fortunate to have, um, to have farmers like, like these three farmers out there who are publishing their information and sharing it so, so broadly. And, um, and we've, when I, we started farming, there was a lot of good information, but not the same that is now. And, um, uh, and there was, you know, Elliot Coleman was cropping on a small acreage, but it wasn't really looked at as a, as, as a mod. Like, not everybody really believed it could happen, but it's really hard to dispute these people. And um, so it's, it's a really fantastic time to have these systems already really fleshed out, and you can work with them. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump into our farm. Um, so we're uh, La Ferme Coopérative Tournesol, Tournesol Cooperative Farm. And Tournesol is French for sunflower, and it's kind of similar to Hirasol, and it kind of means turning towards the sun but it's also a play on words, which means turning the soil. Um, and that's who we are. And we're a worker co-op that's made up of five members. And so we're incorporated as a worker co-op. And one of the consequences of that is that each person has one vote, independent of any number of shares they own in the business. Um, so it makes it something that's fairly egalitarian. And um, dividends or profit is redistributed in function of hours worked during the season. Um, and um, yes, we do meet a lot, and we do talk a lot, but uh, we've been together for about 11 or 12 years, and our systems have gotten, you know, we've learned how to, how to, how to communicate. And so I'm going to introduce the different farm members. Um, so one of them is, is Renee. Uh, she is one of, we have two field managers that kind of share the job. Um, so she's one of the two field managers. She also manages the greenhouse, and she deals with all our organic certification. Um, there's Emily, uh, who is at the conference this weekend, also my wife. But um, Emily is the harvest coordinator of the farm, and she's the other field manager. Um, and she also leads our dried tea production. Um, so then we have Fred, who is the bookkeeper. He does all the CSA administration, and he does all the CS, the soil fertility planning. We have Reed, who's in charge of all the infrastructure and machinery, maintenance. Uh, he manages our cover crop uh, and um, our apprentice uh, program. And then there's myself, and I'm in charge of the seed production, and I deal with our website and our newsletter. Um, and so I'm responsible when it's not on time, like it's been lately. And so the five of us run the business, um, and we also do a fair amount of field work. So we are involved in planting, weeding, harvesting. Um, and as the business has gotten bigger, we're less involved in some of those tasks. And the other part of the team is our apprentices and employees. Um, so we have paid apprentices, and then we have employees who have been with us for a few years who might potentially become new co-op members in the future. And uh, so last year we had five people uh, hired on the farm, and then this year we'll have seven. So this operation that I'm, explain, I'm describing is 12 people in the peak of the season. And through the winter, it's about six or seven people. Um, 
we rent uh, our land just west of Montreal. Um, so we have 18 rented acres, and on that, there's about 12 and a half tilled acres. So the non-tilled acres are like, you know, the access ways and for places where the barn is and roads and, that, and headlands. And that takes a lot of space, especially when you're a tractor-based system. Um, of those tilled acres, we have seven acres that are in cash crop. Um, three, and a, three and a quarter acres are actually in seed production, which you may have seen in the, the workshop yesterday, or I guess two days ago. Um, the rest is in mostly vegetables, but a bit of flowers and some other crops. Um, and then we have about five and a half acres that are only, like, they're only in cover crop during the whole year. Like in our vegetable, in our cash crop, we do try to have a cover crop before or after, but in our cash crop fields, it's only cash crop. So it's a, a kind of like a four year out of seven cash crop rotation. Um, what percentage of your seed do you grow yourself? So, what percentage of seed do we grow ourselves? So for seed that we use on farm, it's somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, and that really depends on whether you're talking about dollar value or seed count or seed weight. So it's a funny metric to deal with, but, um, but it's about 10 to 30 percent that we're using. Um, and then of the seed that we sell through our seed company, we produce about 70% ourselves, and about 20% we're contracting close to us, and about 10% is coming from other climates that have better climates for specific seed, seed types. So um, about three quarters of our revenue um, is, comes from vegetables, and uh, we are predominantly staple growers. So we grow, car we grow orange carrots, we grow red tomatoes, we grow, well, we grow all kinds of potatoes. Um, but we do grow some weird stuff, but it's really the staples that we focus on. And about 40% of the vegetables, 35 to 40% go through one farmer's market on a, uh, on a Saturday. Um, it's about 25 minutes from us. And then the rest of the vegetables mostly go through a 350 member uh, CSA basket program. Um, and um, so it's something like maybe like 600 families that we're feeding, five to 600 families we're feeding on a weekly basis. And uh, this has been the foundation of our business from the beginning was vegetables, and, but it's shrunk into only three quarters over the year. Um, about one-eighth of our production now is in garlic. We sell garlic as uh, seed stock and as table stock, and we have like a dozen varieties and something that we're known for. And the other eighth of our business is seeds. And uh, so this is Mizuna seed crop. Um, we harvest things by hand. We thresh by hand. This is a high-tech screening system. And winnowing system, um, and um, we sell our seeds through an online store, a print catalog. Um, we also have seed racks, and we go to different farm markets or seed events during the winter, um, and we sell seed to other seed companies. So there's a very lot of more diversification in the seed business than there in the vegetable business. Um, and the seed business is a part of the business that's growing at like 20 to 50 percent a year. Um, they're, what I find in a lot of bigger metropolitan areas is there's a lot, like 10 years ago when we got into organic farming, there was a lot less competition. Um, and the easy market, there's more competition for. Not, I mean, people are eating vegetables and they want to eat good vegetables. So there is a limitless market, but it's more work to deal with. With the seeds, there's not the same competition. So it's, it's something that's been interesting for us to expand. Um, but we're also expanding slowly because uh, we want to make sure that when we do expand, we're not burning clients and that we can build relationships that, that, that sustain. And, um, and that's something that it's nice to have the vegetable business to be the foundation for that. So um, just to term some numbers. So we have about 12 or 12 and a half tilled acres, seven acres are cash crop. We're generating about $450,000 off of that. This is paying salaries for five farmer owners, and we're probably making about 40000 a year from that. And then we have four employees and three paid apprentices that are being paid something like maybe eleven fifty to 13 or 14 bucks an hour, depending how long they've been with us. And that's something that, um, you know, probably the oldest apprentice with us has been with us for maybe, or employee has been with us for about three years, maybe four years. And it's something that, as we expand, we really, the wages of, of, our, of our workers is really important to, to, to be able to, to, to increase that too, because we couldn't do it without them. And then we have three tr tractors, a cultivating tractor and a BCS rototiller, so a lot of machinery. Um, and we work about 40 to 45 hours a week, um, and we rotate the market. So there's five of us, so I would go to market once every five weeks. And then we have a couple of apprentices who are with us, or sometimes hired employees specific for that, for that event. And... Um, so it means that a busy week is something like 50 to 55 hours. Um, 
but on average it's 40 to 45 hours a week. And we've been working like this since the beginning. Um, this is not a, like, for us, quality of life has always been an important part. And um, being a co-op, it kind of incited us to maybe work less because having one or two people where I was working twice as much as everyone else, it's hard to kind of have a balance or, or, or fairness in that. So we've kind of just, you know, it took a while to get going, but once we got a schedule set down, it's been pretty easy to, to maintain that. And um, so of the five co-op members, there's two couples in there. And so, gener so we take a vacations during the week and during the summer, and usually couples will leave together. Um, and um, so all of the farmers are taking probably about two weeks of vacation during the season, maybe one whole week, and then a number of like long weekends. Um, and that's something that we've been doing fairly, since fairly early in our operation, too. Um, yeah. Any questions about... It's probably something like, um, probably something like 45% profit margin, and that profit margin is going into salaries for the five farmers. So that's kind of that's what, that's what's what's paying us. But that doesn't include our paid staff, which is probably like I don't know, that's maybe like eighty thousand dollars. That's our largest single expense. It doesn't include. It, our, in our, when, in what I call our profit margin, I said it's 45%. That doesn't include the paid staff. It's just the five farmers' oh, yeah, salary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you say you split the uh, profits between the uh, each member. Yeah. Have you ever had a year where the, something happened in your crops where it was a crash and you ended up taking nothing? Um, yes. <laughs> the first, yes. Yeah, so there's a question. The question was um, we say we, we, we split profits to the farmers. And is there any year that we wound up having no dividends? And, um, and yes, there have been some years. The first five or six years, you know, we plan very conservatively, and we do so much better. And some years, it was amazing how much better we did. And that was like that for five years or so. And then suddenly, we started having not the same, re like, recruitment wasn't as easy for the CSA. The market sales weren't going up the same rate. And so we had two or three years where it was kind of, we were making what we were projecting. And so there wasn't a dividend to, to redistribute. At this point, um, we're kind of getting out of that, and it's you know you kind of figure out what the different problems are and how you had to expand out of that. Um, but we do plan around us having salaries, and so that's we've always been drawing a salary, and so when I say a profit or a dividend, that's above and beyond that. Okay, um, so what is crop planning? Which what you guys are here to learn? Um, crop planning is trying to figure out how much to grow. Uh, what you want to grow, and when to plant it. And you want to do this before the season begins. And this is pretty important because otherwise we call it crisis management. And, um, uh, and you know, if you can't make your farm work on paper, it's really hard to make your farm work in the field. So um, a, what I'm going to be talking about is... Uh, we wrote a book, I maybe mean, in 2008, called Crop Planning for Organic Vegetable Growers. I read it with my, wrote it with my co-farmer, Fred. Mostly based on our systems, but a little bit separate, too, because once you start writing stuff out, you, know, you realize that what you're doing is very intuitive, so we had to kind of create a system that kind of worked on its own. Um, so this, this book does go through all the steps I'm going to talk about in much bigger detail than I'm going to go through some of those steps. And what I'm going to try to do is talk about things that aren't specifically addressed in here or that have changed a bit since we first wrote this. And if you do want to get the nitty gritty, I mean, we also only have a couple hours, you guys can go and find this book and, um, uh, and, uh, and read away and plan away. And so the, the process that we've broken it down into is an 11-step process um, that kind of starts with where you want to be and works backwards. So the first thing you want to figure out is what you're trying to get out of this farm. And in the case, I'm going to talk mainly about the sales, but we'll talk a little about quality of life too. And once you know how much you need to make from your farm, figuring out what a marketing plan that would, that would meet that financial need. And then once you have your marketing plan, then it's a matter of figuring out when you want to grow those crops and how much to grow to meet it. And then what you have to start in the greenhouse or a nursery so that you're able to plant it on time. And going back to how much seed you need to have on hand to plant in the greenhouse and then in the field. Um, 
And that's kind of the crop plan itself is your field planting schedules, your greenhouse schedules, and your seed order. Those are kind of the three pieces of your crop plan. And so the next part of the process is kind of how you carry out the plan and then how you'll adapt it. Um, and then analyzing profitability. And sometimes it's fun to look at profitability first, but we'll look at it a little bit later. Um, but I'll make reference to it. And then the last thing you want to do is once you've gone through a season is you plan for the next year. And so I'm going to focus more on the first couple steps and the later steps, and I'm going to kind of breeze over three through seven, just showing some of the, some of the math. Um, but um, uh, yeah. And I would say before you start farming and before you start crop planting your own farm, it's also, you know, a lot of us want to jump into a, to a, to a new career or lifestyle, but it's really um, having prior experience will increase your success. Um, even once you start your farm, there's so many things you don't know. And so if you are thinking about farming and you haven't started, I might recommend or I would recommend that you go out and maybe take another year off or two years off before starting farming to go work on a farm. And um, uh, it could be a paid apprenticeship or an unpaid apprenticeship or just an employee. But working on a farm that works is really a great way to learn the skills. And because there's a lot of stuff that's not intuitive. And once you start farming, like harvest speed and efficiency, these are things that are much easier to be shown than to figure out on your own. And they're much easier to be shown than to learn from a book or a YouTube video, though those can help for sure. And I'm, um, so uh, I, I can't highlight enough the amount of importance of going and getting training of some sort is. I mean, if you wanted to, st to start up you know, a car shop and be a mechanic, you wouldn't just open a shop and get people to start bringing cars to you and you take out your wrenches. You know, maybe you've, if you've been fixing cars for 15 years on your own, you'd feel comfortable doing that, but you have that training. You know? And it's the same thing with farming. And farming, you know, you have so many growing skills, so many business skills. There's also those mechanical skills. And all those things um, need to be at a fairly high level for everything to work really well. And um, once you start farming, sometimes it's hard to keep learning because you're dealing with the crises as they come along. And I would sometimes, if you are having a really hard time on your farm and not making it work, it might be worth maybe taking a season off and working for somebody else, or finding a farm that, that you respect close by and going to work one or two days a week through a part of the season to kind of see how it's happening there. And, um, and sometimes once you've farmed, you know what the real questions are you should have asked in your training. So that's, that's, that's a really important step. So when we start our goals, we all choose to farm for a lot of reasons. And um, there's a big reason, probably if you guys are choosing to farm, that are based in, you, you know, there's a certain environment and ecology that you want to be part of and you want to see. And you want to be encouraging the natural, healthy things in the world as opposed to, to hindering them or at least standing by. So, you know, the plant life, the flowers and all that are part of what motivates us. There's also, you know, it's fun to work outdoors. Um, it's fun to be your own boss. Um, and so there's... That part is really great. You also probably want to be able to enjoy your life a little bit and not work all the time. Um, and you probably also want to grow good food, you know, and you know, ferment and pickle and put up food. So the eating part is really important too. And then, you know, if you have employees and stuff on your farm, you want to have a good social life with them. This is our annual employee apprentice uh, um, appreciation lunch. Um, at the end of every, uh, every, the last Friday of every month, we have a barbecue at the farm. We break off an hour earlier and have a, a barbecue. Friends and family come, other farmers come. Um, really challenging events. Um, and th this, this, this aspect is really at the core of why we farm. And I am barely going to touch on any of this. What I'm going to talk about is money. And, um, and if you can't make enough financially to meet your needs, it's really hard to appreciate all these other things. And it can put a lot of strain on your family relationships with your, your partner, with your kids, and it can put strain on business partners if you have them, or fa and, and friends. So um, I'll talk a lot about money, but really what I'm, 
the money is important because of this quality of life that we're striving for. And there's a couple principles I'm going to address that come from um, the holistic management systems. And so holistic management is a, um, a system developed by Alan Savory. He has a really huge book. Um, it's a bit dense to read. Um, but that focuses on setting your holistic management goal that involves, it focuses around quality of life. And there is finance as a part of it. Um, but um, if you want to get really into that, it's great to go read the book. But even better, it's great to go and follow a course. Because sometimes when we're reading a book, we focus on the wrong things. Whereas if you're taking a three or, three or six day workshop on holistic management, you will leave knowing what the things are you're supposed to focus on. And so um, we'll bring this to setting financial goals. Um, so if you are in your first year of farming and you're just launching, how much would you guys like to make in your pocket that year? Anybody want to throw a number out? 10 grand, 20 grand, 40, 45, 40, 45. Yeah. low numbers. <laughs> so let's say you wanted to make 10 grand in year one. Maybe down the line in year four, you want to make 40 grand. Um, this number here is a personal number, and it's based on what your living expenses are. You know, if you have a mortgage, you have kids and all that kind of stuff. And... Um, you know, in the long term, if you're only making 10000 a year, there's a lot of people in our society who couldn't make that, who couldn't survive on that. Some people can. So this is personal to yourself, what this is. Um, also, you know, you might have an off-farm job that's deriving enough of an income to support most of your needs, or maybe your partner has an off-farm job. And... Um, it's, you know, we, we enter farming wanting to do it fully, and wanting to work full time and maybe think that's a great thing. And it can be a great thing, but sometimes it's easier financially to be farming part time. And that's a choice that, um, you know, you don't want to farm full time and burn yourself out. Maybe it's better to have a miserable job and have some happiness in the farm. Um, uh, or you can have a good job and have happiness in the farm too. Um, but but you, d you, d you don't have to bank everything that you're doing on, 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 on these systems. So. The first, and this, so what I'm going to go through with financial goals, this comes specifically from holistic, holistic um, management's financial planning tools, is the first thing you do is figure out how much you want to have in your pocket. Next, you figure out what farm income is going to generate that. And a target number that they like to look at is about 50% of your gross sales or farm income should be your profit or your, your salary um, uh, that, that's going into your pocket. And so if you follow that number, you could double it. And then what's left is your expenses. And this is a fairly simple math here. Um, so if you want to make $10,000, if you can make $20,000 and only spend $10,000, you'll have $10,000 profit. So, so in your expenses, are you, you're including your own salary? No. In this case, expenses is money that's not going in your pocket. So this here, and that's why I call it salary as opposed to just profit, because it's money that you're paying yourself to run your farm. And um, whether you think of it as an hourly wage or you think it as a lump sum, it's still something that that's what you're taking out. And that's, in some ways, the most important part of your operation is what you get out of that, because that's what you're working for. You know, if you're out there hand weeding on your knees and you're working 80 hours a week, it's because you're expecting to get something out of here. You know, it's not hand weeding for 25 hours in a week that's going to make, you know, nature and the world a better place. Um, but it's because you expect that you're going to have a better income coming out of that. And, and that's really important to, to think that way. And we'll come back to that in a second. So... The expenses are the farm expenses, not personal. Yes. And I'll, yes, that's farm expenses. Um, so I'll just, just to clarify that, this expenses is the operating expenses of your farm. So it's your seed costs, your fertility costs, um, marketing costs. It's not your lunches or beer or, um, and well, and it's not necessarily even your internet bill. And we'll, I'll touch base on that in a second. Yeah. Well, so it, so how do taxes get figured in? And that depends on how you're set up. Um, but generally, if you're like, um, 
generally, you will be getting some taxes at the expense level. Well, so I guess it depends if you're a sole proprietor or if you're just declaring it on your own income taxes or if you're running as, an incorpor uh, as a corporation or as a, as a worker co-op. So in the case of where we're a worker co-op, um, the business itself pays taxes to the government, and that's a business expense. We make an income that we declare on our personal income tax, and then we get taxed on that also, and that's a personal expense. And so when you're looking at how much you need to make a living, you have to be aware of what your taxes are going to be. Uh, you only make that mistake once, um, and um, hopefully. Um, yeah. <laughs> so a couple guidelines, and these are starting to be a bit out of date, but you know, a new farmer who doesn't have a lot of experience can expect to make you know, five to $10,000 of gross, farms, gross sales sort of per person starting out. Now, if you've been working for five years, this, you might be able to do on another farm, you might be able to do much better than that. But if you're really new to it, um, this number here might seem low, but it's possibly a good realistic approach. Um, there's been a lot of analysis of different farms that are generating quite a bit of revenue, depending on acreage and, and, other, and other parameters. And it looks like on a lot of those farms, it's about $40,000 of gross sales per person that you can expect. But when I'm looking at numbers like from Curtis and Jean Martin, I think that those numbers, there might be higher numbers that are possible now if you have good running farms. And it's really fantastic to aim for that, but until you're there, you probably should plan more conservatively. Um, and once you've gone through your first year, you'll have a better idea what's more realistic in subsequent years. And you know, it's great to have a, gr a great first year, but it's also, um, you know, you don't want to have to if you don't do well that first year, you don't want that to compromise your existence. So um, you need to make a budget to keep your expenses on track. So for this question, you were saying that um, uh, gross sales per person is per person, that's worse for the time on the farm? Yeah. Yes. And, okay. So um, the question was, do I mean, when I say gross sales per person, is someone who works full time on the, on the farm? And I would say yes. And that is probably looking at like, a nine-month season, or you know, maybe seven or eight-month season working full-time, not necessarily year-round. Like in our climate, we do work year-round, but in the winter, it's a lot of planning and machinery maintenance, and um, that's not directly generating sales. It's the stuff that you're doing in the summer that's directly generating the sales, unless you have like a winter production. Yeah. The, the salary. Yeah. Then you would have the farm income, so you want four hundred thousand. And then would the labor costs come out of the expenses, or for the other people who are working for you who aren't the owner? Okay. So um, I'm just going to try to illustrate what you're talking about. So if we want to make forty thousand dollars as individuals, okay. So if we're five people that want to make forty thousand dollars. That means our profit is 20, uh, 200 thou. So by the rule that I'm showing, we would need to make $400,000 of sales to generate this income for us. And then we'd have about $200,000 um, for expenses. Is that clear up to here? So this, this is the math that would happen. Um, and we're close to that. We're about 450, so it's not that far from that. Now, if I use this number here, $40,000 gross sales per person, that's here. So if I'm doing $400,000 divided by $40,000, I would need about 10 people, which includes the five of us, to run this operation. And this is an important thing to see. It's not that the top farmers who have been farming for 20 years on a farm make this, and then the new apprentices make that. It's rather... When you have good managers who are managing a system, everybody's making this kind of money. And so in our case, if we're, 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 so we, were, we were 10 people last year, and we were about, let's say, 400,000. So this is actually quite accurate on our farm. And I haven't looked at it this way recently, so I'm really happy that it, my math works out. <laughs> and I'm not saying the opposite. Um, um, yeah. So two... And now, the thing is, you have to not spend 
more than this expense number if you want to make that income. You know, you want to make those sales, you don't want to spend more than this, and that's how you'll make that. Um, and so you got to make a budget, and I don't have a lot of tools that I'm sharing right now with budgeting. Um, there's, you know, I think Jean-Martin Curtis's book, um, our book, all have different sample budgets, and there's no one budget for a farm. Um, but there are two elements that I want to highlight that that you have to be aware of when you're budgeting. One is the difference between cash flow and a profit and loss statement. And so um, when you're looking at your annual budget, um, if you're buying a $20,000 greenhouse, that might, and you're only gonna make $20,000, that $20,000 greenhouse might seem to just cancel out all the profit. And um, the thing is, that greenhouse is going to last for at least 10 years. So in terms of accounting, you want to depreciate that or amortize it over a number of years. And it depends on what kind of item it is. But so you would say that that $20,000 greenhouse over 10 years is $2,000 a year. Um, so that when you have your, 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 your budget, it's just a depreciation that shows up. You do have to pay for the greenhouse, though. And so that's where you might need to have savings that you already have, or take a loan, or have been more profitable in a future year. And so that's something that, when I talk about expenses, I'm talking about annual operating expenses. So it's the things that you're spending in that specific year. And, um, um, and another thing is, so on a farm like ours, where there's five people running it, and we're registered as a worker co-op, there's a clear distinction what's our personal life and what's a, what's a farm business. Um, but if you are running your farm and running off your own personal income tax return, there's a lot of expenses that you can hide um, or that get me melded in to your, to, 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 to your business. And um, I'm not going to comment on the appropriateness of that or not, but I think it's important to be aware of what expenses are going in. Because if you look and 85% of your revenue is going to expenses, and you're complaining about that, but all your rent, all your, you know, all your travel supplies, food and other things are also being covered in there, then it's not actually 85% of your business is business expenses. So that's something that you should make a, a strong distinction of when you're bu budgeting. So the important thing with the budget is that you're paying yourself. And this is the thing that you want to do is you want to pay yourself first. And it's really easy when you're running a business to have expenses that pop up and you just pay them. And as you do that, the money disappears. And you have less and less that you're saving. So one thing you can do is have a separate bank account for your business than for yourself. And on a monthly basis, transfer money over as if you were paying yourself a wage. So that it's not just at the end of the year that you're taking a lump sum out. And not having that money in the bank account means that you can't accidentally spend it because something breaks or you have a night, something strikes your fancy. And so, um, um, yeah, and so, so there. <laughs> um, so just coming back at this, the salary is what you want. And so you're trying to make sure you're, you're getting it. You want to control your expenses. If your farm income is better, you should think of that. You should try to maintain your expenses that what they were before because that extra goes into your pocket. You don't want to be working a lot extra just so you can buy new things that you're going to be using up. Now, if you make extra and that means you can afford a better tool or something that's going to last in a while, then that can be investment. But again, it kind of converts back into the depreciation I was mentioning. But if you just wind up spending $10,000 extra on compost um, because you made $10,000 more, um, though that's good for the soil, you know, it's, it's just, it's, you're, you're, you're hurting your business. And so, if you've been farming for five years or 10 years, you should ask yourself, are you where you want to be? And that where you want to be often comes down to two things. It's, you know, how much are you making and how much are you working? And if you're not making very much and you're working way too much, you have to think yourself, to yourself, you know, why or why not am I there? And often going back to the basics of looking at this is the starting point. 
before you've even looked at what your crop mix is. You know, is how much money do I need to make? If I'm gr grossing 80,000, but only making 10,000 and spending 70,000 in expenses, well, I might be able to make 10,000 just by grossing 20,000. So making a smaller business will have maybe less labor costs, less cost across the board, and it's less work to do it. And that is the, a really important step. Um, and um, because if you've been working hard for five or 10 years at something, and the system hasn't evolved much from what it was in your first year, what's to make you think it's going to evolve in the next five to 10 years? And so you have to go down, and you have to look at the numbers. And this is the first number to look at. So from here, so what you come out of with this is how much money you want to make during the year. And this is the basis of your marketing plan. And your marketing plan has four pieces. It's the methods that you're going to sell or distribute your product, your vegetable list, your crop list, what the prices are going to be, and then what you're planning on harvesting on a weekly basis. Um, so there's a lot of different distribution methods. One that a lot of people know about is community-supported agriculture, CSAs. And that's a formula where folks pay in the beginning of the season or commit to the beginning of the season, and they might pay a few times over the year. And then they come to the farm or to a drop-off point, and they pick up a set basket of vegetables, and they get that over, over the season. So a farmer with a community-supported agriculture system knows up front how many folks he's growing for. And he has a chunk of the money, or maybe all the money, before the season begins. And this is fantastic in terms of covering early expenses and being able to pay yourself. Um, it's also known the number is really fantastic in terms of planning, but having this money paid up front is very stressful because you have to deliver. And um, even when you've been farming for 10 or 15 years, there's still a stress to deliver. And when you have a tough year, you're thinking about the people who have committed to you. Um, and when you're only farming a couple years, you really feel that, especially if it's all your, friend, your closest friends and family who have signed up with you. So um, this is a, our, I saw a few pictures of our drop-off. Um, we have a drop-off on the farm. We have a drop-off, well, it's no longer, it was, for a while it was at a church. It's moved over because there wasn't enough space anymore. Um, and in our system, it's called a market style, where the vegetables are out, like at a farmer's market, and then folks line up, give their name. There's a board with what's in the basket. Um, some of it's in English, well, some of it's English, some of it's in French, but some of it's individual items, some of it's, you know, choices. And then folks go down, and then they fill their own basket or bag or box and, uh, and, and make, make, their, make their, their, their basket. Some people have pre-made baskets that they deliver. Um, we like this system because it reduces the amount of packaging work beforehand, but it increases the amount of time at the drop-off. But more time spent at the drop-off is more time that you can talk to your clients and better build that relationship. Um, and we have stuff that's you know, bunched as items, but then there's also stuff that's bulk. And you can deal with weight, but we found that dealing with volume is a lot easier. People can kind of just scoop and put things in a bag. So we'll do potatoes by volume. We'll do tomatoes by volume. We'll have salad mix and green beans and, and green peas by volume. Um, and even at certain times of the season, we'll start to move carrots by volume. And what's nice about by volume is we could have carrots and beets and turnips, and people can mix and match how they want in that volume. The one challenge with the volume system is that there's some people who will put like half of it in, you know, and they're trying to be, they're, 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 they're more conservative about it. And then other people really pack it in. And, and so the average might be what you're planning on giving out, but you don't want to be, and if, it were, if everyone's happy, that works. But you don't want to be shortchanging clients who, um, who would like to have more, especially if they feel they didn't get enough, but it's just because they didn't put enough in the bin. Um, dealing with, you have a scale, it can get around that, but you have to have good logistics if you have a lot of people to keep the flow through that scale, around that scale. And then we also have a, an exchange basket. So we have extra items that we'll put in the basket. Sometimes it might be stuff that's left over from market, but maybe not salad greens, but like carrots or beets. And then people can come in and they can, if there's something they don't like or allergic to, already have in their fridge, they might put that in the basket and take something out. Um, and then we'll try to restock it partway through the season so it's not only like one item that week. Um, and that's how we give a certain amount of flexibility without having tailor-made vegetables. That and like some choices in the basket. So 
These numbers are based on an Easter, a northeastern climate or a northern climate. So they might be different if you're farming in somewhere like San Diego or California. But the, the, the types of things you need to know. So you need to know how many weeks you're targeting for. And um, if you are in a climate where winter is serious, you probably want to be dealing with 16 to 20 weeks. Um, and if you're new to CSA, you might be wanting to deal with less. And it's the spring can be really tough because you don't know sometimes when spring is actually going to start. And also, really cold springs and really wet springs can really slow production down and really make those first baskets tough to fill. And then the fall can be tough because at a certain point, you need to harvest crop that you're storing to, to, to distribute later. And that's where having good storage systems really makes a difference. And sometimes that's not top notch. So it's not that full 20 weeks that you might be able to easily do. And if you're thinking 26 or 30 or 35 weeks, you know, that's even more commitment that you have. So if you're newer to CSA or a new CSA, I would say start less weeks. If you have a great season, then you can extend weeks and you can just have a longer season. You need to know what the value is per basket. And here I'm highlighting 15 to $45. If you do the math and you have more weeks at a higher value, it's just more money, and that's nice math, but a big basket is much harder to fill in a satisfying way than a smaller basket is. Um, one kind of complaint you don't want from your members is that they're getting too much stuff and they're having to compost it or give it away. That leads to dissatisfaction. So maybe having baskets somewhere in the $25 to $30 range might be easier to fill with a reasonable number of, uh, of vegetables. How much do you charge a week or for the total? I'll get to that. Yeah, and then, so if you're a new, far new CSA farmer, you could probably generate about five to 20 shares per person. Experienced farmers are generating anywhere from 30 to 75 shares per person, and it can depend on other kinds of market outlets they have. So this is not really that prescriptive with such a broad range. Um, what do you mean by shares? So shares is, a sh so with CSAs, part of the language is you're buying a share of the harvest, so each, each member is a share. It's a good question though. Um, so our farm, the way that we work is we have, you can pick up every week or every two weeks. We've chosen not to have a big and a small size. That's every week. And having one size that you pick up every week or every two weeks is easier to fill. Because if you have a big size and a small size, it's hard to make them both fair in relation to one to the other. And if your small shares are too generous, people will downsize over time. And if your big shares are too generous, or the small shares aren't generous enough, people might just bail out. So um, we have, we, the way we deal with weeklies and biweeklies is that, um, let's say we have 100 people that sign up to be biweeklies, we divide into two groups of 50. And 50 come one week and 50 come another week. So it's a static number that we have across the board. So when I say we're dealing with 350 uh, members a week, it's probably about 200 that are weekly and maybe 150 that are biweekly. So it's actually 300 families that are biweekly but only getting half a week. Um, and so if you do the math of your delivery fee times your cost, you have what the value of the vegetables in. The next thing, the Equiterra fee, does not apply to anyone here. <laughs> this is, uh, in Quebec, there's a network that coordinates CSAs, and it's, they're funded by CSAs that are part of them giving a share of their, of their business. So I'm not going to discuss that. Um, one thing we do, though, is if we'd rather have people sign up weekly. You know, it's just, it's just less people to deal with, and it's easier. You know, you get a bigger check at the beginning or bigger checks, less people to chase after for, 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 for payment. So <coughs> we take off a dollar a week um, for the for people who commit to every week. So that's $22 for 22 weeks. So that's, the total, that's, how, we sh that's how we price our vegetables. And then when we're actually, that's how we price our share. We're actually aiming to put 15 to 20% more value than they've paid for on this line uh, as, as vegetables that they get. And we base that price on our market price. And because we sell at a farmer's market, we have, a, we have that price list. Um, so off of $29.50, that might be something like $35 or $36 we're trying to put um, on average in, in a share. And sometimes it's a little lower and sometimes it's a little higher. So, um, so yeah, we'll come back to some of the differences. Um, farmers markets, um, you go to the market, you have your stuff,
People come, they buy what they want. What they don't buy, you can swap or eat or compost or feed to the pigs. Um, in some cases, you can store it. Like if it's onions or potatoes, you might be able to store it for the future. Um, some people will sell stuff from that. Like at a re if they have a lot of greens that are wilting, they might sell at a reduced rate to a restaurant or something if it's going to be processed or give it to a food shelter. Um, diversity of crops. <laughs> We're not going to talk about the farmer's market as much. But with the farmer's market, what you want to think about is how much you want to make over the whole season, knowing how many weeks you're going, and what that looks like on an average week. Now, um, you probably, ideally, you could have that average week every week through the season, and that spreads the work out. But it might be that you're making 300 at one point and 1,000 at another point, and then less at the end again. Um, and that's something that's going to come in with each, with, with, with differently with each, with each operation. Um, uh, but with farmer's market, there's a certain amount of unpredictability that comes into it. However, the longer you're in the same market, the more you can see trends. And if you can sell 100 bunches of carrots one week, you're likely to sell roughly 100 the next week, maybe 90, maybe 110. But it would be very exceptional you could sell 300 the next week or that you'd only sell 10 bunches the next week. There can be markets that are based in you know, certain types of touristic areas that do have a big fluctuation of people that can be like that. But most markets sort of st get standard and they might have a low period in the spring or a high period, like it might change by type of season, but it rarely changes from week to week, every week. And another way you can sell is sort of in a wholesale or a semi-wholesale way through restaurants and stores. And this is the part that I don't have a lot of experience with, so I don't have any pictures. Um, and uh, this is something that, going back to Curtis's documents, is really fantastic. This, these restaurants on stores, you're generally going to be getting a, le a lower price than you're getting if you're doing direct market to a grocery to a, to a direct to a farmers market or CSA. But you can often have a higher volume that's offset, and it can also be, you know, at a farmers market, if I'm there from seven in the morning to 3 p.m., that's a lot of time spent marketing, and if I hire people to work there, it's a lot of time. Whereas you could maybe make the same amount of sales to a client like this in a shorter period of time. So um, you're making less money, but you have less marketing expenses, and that can really make a difference. And um, there's a tendency to not like wholesale in the small farm world, um, but wholesale can be profitable if it's run white, right. Um, you know, and then, so that's a lot of things. One thing is, we are in a golden age of vegetable growing, but not necessarily in a golden age of developing clients. And a lot of places have a ton of CSAs now. A lot of places had some great farmer's markets, but every neighborhood now has a farmer's market. So some of the farmers that were making a certain amount in one market now have to go to two or three markets to say make the same amount of, of, of money. Um, and it means that, you know, we're targeting the same demographic and dividing up in the pie into smaller pieces. And there's, but there's all the people are eating, you know? And so finding ways to tap into new markets is really one way to go really great. You know, having great product will sell itself, but finding new ways to market it will sell itself, will also create a revenue. So in our case, we've diversified with seeds, you know? So that's something that's an agricultural product, we use the same kind of crop planning, but by going with seeds, it's given us a different kind of um, stability, and we're in a marketplace that's easier to develop. Um, we have a print catalog. Um, sometimes people talk about value-added. And value-added, people often think about making tomato sauce or jam or something else in a can um, with a nice label. Um, the thing about what I find with value-added is if, I, if you want to have a good value add, like a good jam or other processed product, you want to start with good product. If you're starting with your worst stuff that wasn't harvested, it's hard to have a top-notch product. And if you're putting top-notch product in a jar, are you getting more for it than if you just sold it at a farmer's market? And so it's not, an, it's not this easy source of money to just generate extra revenue. Now, if you can produce top-notch product and you're in an area that can't meet that demand, converting it into a value-added product that you can get a good price for is really great because a value-added product often is non-perishable the same way that something goes to farmer's market is. You can travel further afield with it, and if you don't sell it, you can bring it back home. But if you have a fantastic market 
that is happy to pay good prices for fresh vegetables, well, you're not, you don't have to process them and spend time in the kitchen and all the other, other, other marketing expenses. And sometimes value added can mean different things. Like in the case of this garlic, we bunch it, put a little label on it, and then we can sell it for five bucks more because it's in a braid. So with $20 of garlic, it goes to 25 bucks. And there is work that goes into it, but if you can do it quick enough, the work pays for itself. So you're adding value because now it's a beautiful thing, it's an ornamental thing, it's a great gift. So value means different things to different people. And a last part of the world these days is, is, is web stores. And this is something that you can, meet, you can find people much broader than just your farmer's market. A lot of people are doing online shopping, and there are so many platforms that you can use to work with this kind of thing. So it's something that is worth thinking about how you might be able to do to, 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 to sell that way. Shipping can be an issue, um, but not always. Um, it depends on, you know, it could be that people order this way and they come and pick it up, or they come and pick up a central spot. Um, so figuring out how you're going to distribute is very key in whether you'll be able to sell it. Um, so if you have a CSA, you have to probably have more staples. You can't just do salad greens and cilantro. You're probably talking about at least 20 crops, maybe more. If you start selling at farmer's market, there is, an, there is definitely an appeal to have a broad range of crops and to meet every client's dem every demand. But there's also an interest in specializing. You can be a salad green person, you can be the garlic guy, and people come to you for that specific product. In the short term, it's probably more gross sales to have a diversity, but down the line, if you do build your reputation and your brand, that specialization can be very crazy, how much you can sell through it. When you talk about restaurants and stores, you can deal with, with diversity, but probably want to go for more for specialization. You know, less things, but sell more of it. So from your, and a key part in all of this is that it's going to get better over time, and it's based on the relationships you build. And people keep repeating this, and it's True, you know, you have to take the time to meet people and you have to take the time to listen to their complaints and build on that. Um, so once you know your outlet, you figure out how much you're going to make per outlet, 12000 for the CSA, 10000 for the farmer's market in this example. One thing to think about is if you have a lot of different outlets, um, you want to you know, you treat them right. And it can be difficult, like if you have a CSA and you're going to farmer's market, and you're putting, you're sending your good product to farmer's market, people can start complaining and thinking that you're not treating the CSA well. And it's usually good to know what your key market, your key outlet is, and know what the rest is kind of like the padding. And um, over time, you're able to balance everything really well. But at the beginning, know where you really want to have the best results. And, um, and if you're doing a CSA, I tend to think that that should be where you put the most love because it's the word of mouth that's spreading out that's going to have more clients. And you want to have a low retention rate and a high recruitment rate if you're going to grow. And for sure, the farmer's market, you want to have love there too. But the farmer's market, there's a little bit more variability that's expe expected. Um, Okay, so there's a question, what is the difference of someone going to CSA and getting a basket versus what they get from the farmer's market, or why they would do it? No, as far as prices. So as far as prices. The same amount of product in one place to the other. So we, at CSA, we give people 15 to 20% more than they paid. So if they were to buy the same vegetables at the market that they got at CSA, they would get 35 or 36 bucks. Whereas if they buy it through the CSA, they get $30. So market's like $36, the CSA would be $30. And at first glance, you're like, well, what? So that's nice to have that savings, but also maybe you don't want to have cilantro this week, or maybe you don't. You know, there's, there's also a certain amount of things that you're getting that you might not be your first choice. And people tend to like farmer's markets because of the choice. What's nice about CSA is that when you come at the beginning, at the end, you're going to get something. And you don't have to all come early, you know. And at farmer's markets, tend to be a cluster of people early on because they want to get stuff before it sells out. 
Whereas the farmer's market, you can take your time. So we've definitely found that there's people who don't want to go to farmer's market, and there's people who don't want to go to CSA. And the folks who don't want either, they're probably not the client you're looking for. Um, or maybe they go to a restaurant. There's a lot of different variations on what a CSA is. Yes, there is. How do you deal? Do you have um, affordable options? Do you have barter? Do you have people working at the farm? Do you have a work requirement? On our farm, we don't have a work requirement. So um, there's a lot of different variations in the CSA world. And so the, the question is, um, what are our variations, I guess? You know, do we have a work requirement? Do we have barter? Do we have, um, you know, we, what you see is what we have. <laughs> There's a couple people that we've bartered for, you know, like for, for certain products. But over, most of it is, is, is the, the numbers I was showing earlier. Um, being able to customize your CSA to different situations is a really great way to get new clients. And it can also be a way to, really great to cater to different clients. Um, Food accessibility is an issue, uh, and um, there are some CSAs that, I, there's one CSA that I know that their share might be $30, but you can only pay 20 or 40 for it. You can't pay 30. And so the people who are paying 40, there's 10 bucks of that that's offsetting the people who are paying 20. And, and that's part of the social mission of that, of, that, of that farm. And it's also being run by a registered charity, so that $10 that the 40 people are paying can actually be claimed as a, as, as a charitable receipt. Um, so there's, there's different, different structures you can do. There's, there's CSAs now that have, using online platforms, you can really customize what goes into your basket. And that's a great way to meet your, your client's needs. Um, it becomes more like a buying club. And there are some CSA purists who don't call that a CSA. But I think the CSA world is more and more inclusive of that, because some of the people who are the most hard line about it haven't been able to keep their business running. And, in the end, you know, there's a community of people that are eating organic food that's supporting a farmer. And I actually sometimes don't like to use the word CSA because are these farmers markets supporting any less their community agriculture? We have people who've been, you know, buying more vegetables every week than a CSA member gets for 10 weeks, 30 or 40 weeks of the year. Uh, well, maybe not 40, but 30 weeks of the year. And these people are no less supporting us than the others. So, um, so catering something that meets people's needs, you shouldn't get hung up in what CSA should be, but you should be transparent in explaining what it is for you when you're dealing with your clients. Um, and if you have something that's very different, market it, because that could be a good leverage to get more people. Um, just for an example, we have a market share. Mm -hmm. But one of our biggest demographics is senior women who live by themselves, so they can't do a box share. Yeah. So, so the comment is um, one farmer in the crowd has a, a market share or a market a card at the market. It's called the market share. Called the market share. And so they, have, they pay a certain amount, and then on a weekly basis they can get what they need, and that's just deducted from, from their, their tab. And this works really well for certain demographics, specifically older women, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, um, who might not need, need as many vegetables are in a veg, uh, uh, as in a, in a CSA share. Um, or normal CSA share, and that this is outselling their CSA. So um, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. um, you need to know what you're, what you're growing and how you're going to package it. And um, um, we're not going to talk, about, talk about, much about crop choice, but I would highlight formatting and thinking about it beforehand, because when it comes time to go to market or CSA, if you're just figuring out then that you need elastics or you need a pint or a quart, you're stuck. Also, formats can really change how you sell stuff. When we first started for farming, we had a hard time selling individual peppers. We started putting them in these quarts, you know, four peppers. It could be four really nice red ones, but it can also be a mix of different peppers, and we could sell, whereas before we were selling 20 individual peppers, suddenly we were selling 35 quarts um, with like four peppers each, and that did really well. And so this formatting can change. About three years ago, the course quit selling. Now we're selling a lot of individual peppers again, so it changes. But, but playing with that can make a difference. Um, so just being dynamic through your marketing? Be, well, being dynamic through your marketing is part of the lesson, but also thinking about how the format is the other part that's important. Um, 
pricing is important, and um, we'll talk about, when we talk about profitability later, we'll see the direct relationship between pricing and profits. What I would say is you do not want to be charging more than you are ethically comfortable charging to people. Um, but you should also reflect that many of us who get into farming tend to be on the frugal side and tend to be thinking about vegetable prices from our perspective, but you might be in a market that when they're buying something at the grocery store, it might be twice what you're, they're comfortable paying twice what you're comfortable selling it for. And so um, that can be fantastic if you can sell cheap stuff and you're running a profit, but it's also a place that you can be generating more, more revenue. Um, I would highlight that beautiful, delicious, fresh local, organic produce that stores well sells itself and people come back for it. And so having the great product is what guarantees your success. Being a decent you know, person talking is not bad. You don't want to be a real jerk, but the product is what sells. And, um, um, and one thing I see is that the farms that have the most expensive prices in a lot of farmers markets tend to have the longest lines. So going cheap doesn't guarantee more sales. Um, and often there's a kind of a prestige that might come with the price or an assumption that things are better than the other farmer. Um, if they are better, that's even better. <laughs> but you, um, yeah. So, and then the last part of your marketing system, or your market plan, is a projection. And you want to have, figure out, you know, so all the different crops that you're growing, and then every week how much you're planning on bringing of each thing. And you want to do a projection for all the markets or CSAs or other that you're going to. And um, I'm not going to get too much into the details of those, um, but you, so you want to, so for a CSA share, it's pretty easy to kind of plot out the season because, you know, you know you have 20 people and this is what you'd like to bring to them. Um, and you want to make sure, looking at the math, you want to make sure the math works out. For a market, even if it's a new market that you're dealing with, it's really worth doing this because if you know you need to make $500 a week, doing this on paper will show you what $500 look like. And if, you're plan and if you realize that what you're planning on growing is only $200, you're not going to do it. It's possible that amount is a lot bigger than you think. Um, when you're setting up for a uh, farmer's market, do you portion everything so that like, all your baskets are $5 so that, so that when they're coming to you, you don't have to make change real bad? You're, they come up to you and put down the money and so then there's more options? Um, I would love to have everything at 5 bucks, <laughs> but... But um, what we work, at least everything ends in 50 cents. Um, but we do have stuff that's 250, 350, 450. Um, we, the way our market works is we have like a basket at the beginning. People pack, they pick up the basket and they walk down the line filling items up and they get to the end and there's a table with two or three people who can cash those individuals out. And um, we used to work in a system where we'd, we'd hold an individual's bag and we'd fill the stuff and tally it up as we went along. And, you know, we got to, we were like three people and often a fourth would come in for a couple hours and it just it was getting overwhelming and people are just waiting and you see people leaving. And by shifting to a system where there was a lineup, um, people were able to, you know, you'll have one or two people working in the crowd you know, just talking and responding to questions. But at the cash, the main process is putting things in a bag, taking money and leaving. So it's a turnover of people who want to get out quicker. Um, and so that's worked well for us. And for where we were needed at least four, almost five people at some points, we're down to three people to manage the crowd. Um, and um, um, yeah, so we don't have to worry as much with having like a really easy math number to, uh, to, to or easy number to add um, for that. But it is good thinking about your pricing and how it's going to do it and have enough change on hand. Um, yeah. So this, adding up all your stuff that you need each week becomes your harvest projections, what you're going to need to harvest each week, which is going to be what you're going to want to, um, to work backward from in the next step, which is the crop planning. Um, so I'm going to kind of rush through this part. Um, which is in some ways the most important part after the money and the marketing plan. And this, but um, there's it's just, there's no time to tackle it all. So I'm just gonna show some of the key parts. But what a crop plan includes is your field planting schedule, your field maps of where things are gonna be, your operation schedules of when you're gonna be doing certain type of ground prep to get your beds ready, 
your schedule in your nursery or your greenhouse, and your seed order. So this is the five things that I would call the crop plan. And um, so one part of it, the first thing to do is how you're going to lay out your fields. So these are our fields. We have broken them up into big blocks that are all the same size. And each block has 14 beds that's 300 foot long and 5 foot wide. And that 5 foot wide is from the middle of one path to the next path. And it's designed around our tractor. Um, and we, so each of those blocks is half an acre. And we have 17 blocks like that on our farm. And by having blocks that are the same size, we know that fit, what fits in one block fits in another block. So we can have uniform row cover, uniform sprinklers, uniform drip tape, and not have to be scrounging for different bits. Now, 300 foot long beds work really great with a tractor. If you're working in a system based on a VCS or no-till, this is really overkill. So you want to be designing in function of what, of, of the technology that you're using. And often the technology that, that you're weeding with. But if we were using tractors and we were designing around 50 or 100 foot beds, the turning at the headlands would be happening all the time. We have to have extra, too many headlands and just all that extra turning would reduce the tractor efficiency. Um, so uh, there's no one right size. And that's, that's going to come through as we start talking about a few other parts of the farm. Um, and a piece of language I'm going to use, I'm going to talk about bed feet and row feet, and I just want to clear what that is. So here is a bed of lettuce. If you take a strip like this that's one foot long, there's three lettuce heads in it. So one bed foot would have three lettuce heads. Now, each of these is a row, and if you take a one foot part of the row, that's a row foot. So in the case of lettuce, where we're growing with three rows per bed, that's three, it's one bed foot is equal to three row foot. If we had a row of tomatoes down the middle and it was just one row of tomatoes, well then one bed foot equal to one row foot. I'm not gonna talk about row foot tons. I'm gonna talk about bed foot a lot. Is that kind of clear to everybody? So, um, some of the math that you wanna know is when do you plant? Well, you have to know when you're harvesting, Subtract the days to maturity, and that gives you your plant date. So DTM is days to maturity. This is in a lot of seed catalog. It's how many days the crop is expected to go from the planting to the, har the, the, the maturity when it's harvested. And what's important in this is that you should know whether the catalog seed catalog lists days to maturity from seeding or from transplanting. So you could have a, green a lettuce that's, going for, you know, that's being spent four weeks in a greenhouse and then it's going to spend seven or eight weeks to get to a full size. Or you can have a lettuce that's directly seeded on the ground and then takes five weeks to get to a baby green. So those numbers change. And it's as simple as, so let's say with radishes, you want to harvest them on June 30th, 28 days to maturity. You count backwards on a catalog or you plug it into an Excel spreadsheet and do the math. And you know you have to plant on June 2nd. And this is what it works mathematically. Days to maturity is often set for specific geographic regions where they've been determined and at specific times of year. So what a days to maturity for broccoli in the spring might be, when you get to the heat of the summer, it's like half, this, half that. And in the fall, it might be a lot longer. But it's the best we have when you, start, when, you, when you start. And it's really valuable when you start talking about multiple varieties of the same crop. So if you have a broccoli that has like a 50 days to maturity and one that has a 65 days to maturity, you can expect that one's going to be more early than the other. Whether it's actually two weeks earlier is something different, but you can expect it to be earlier than the other. Um, another equation that you need, need to work with is how much do you plant? And so you start, and so in these equations, there's a number SF that we're, or SF, which is a safety factor. And it's because when you plant out, let's say, let's say you need 100 lettuce, and you plant out 100 lettuce, how many of you are actually going to harvest 100 lettuce? Some of them bolt. Some of them get eaten by groundhogs, by deer. Other things might happen to them. So you want 50 heads of lettuce. And as a general rule, I would use about a 30% safety factor. So that's 1.3. With experience, that starts to change. You might only have a 10% safety factor on kale or chard, and you might have a 50% safety factor on lettuce. Um, which might, at the peak of the season, when it's not holding as well. Um, but it kind of takes more space, the bigger the safety factor. So, you know, 50 heads times 1.3 divided by this density of how, or how many heads you can expect per row foot 
divided by the rows per bed and gives you 22 bed feet. Um, and so you have to do this math for every crop that you're planting throughout the season, for every week that it's going to be harvested. And you can do it by hand, but it's a lot easier with spreadsheets. And we'll touch very briefly on that in a moment. And so similar in the greenhouse, when do you want to plant it? If you want lettuce in the field on June 2nd, it's in the, field, it's in the greenhouse for a certain number of days, say for t four weeks, you need to plant it on May 5th to have it ready. And then for figuring out how much you want to plant in your greenhouse, you start off, let's say you want 15 bed feet of lettuce at three rows per bed, divide by the spacing, times by a safety factor again, divided by the number of cells per tray, you need 0.8 trays. I would probably seed one whole tray um, with that. But so, again, you have to work through all of this to know how much you have to seed at every point of the season. And then from this, this how many seeds do you need? So if it's a direct seeded crop, you got to add up all the bed length that you have over the season. So let's say it's a beet, 165 bed feet, times how many rows per bed, and then how many seeds you're seeding per row, and then another safety factor um, to make sure you have enough seed when you need it, and then you have a certain amount of seeds, so 10,000 seeds. And then this 10,000 seeds, by knowing how many seeds per gram, or grams per ounces, or ounces per pound, you can figure out how many grams, ounces, or pounds you need of that. And this is important because not all seed catalogs sell by seed count. And some seed catalogs sell by metric units or imperial units. So if you're going to be shopping through different catalogs to get the best deal or to see what's comparable, you should know what the different values are. And so again, this can be set up in a spreadsheet so you have four rows side by side. Um, and so this math takes a lot of time. <laughs> um, but with, with the computer, the math itself happens pretty automatic. It's the thought process you're going through as you're building a sheet is what's really important. And seeing where the numbers are funny and working from there. So what we use, and this is something that's different. If you've read our crop planning book, this part is not in the plat crop planning book. And I am working on a series of blog posts to talk about this. because This is what's revolutionized our next step. And it's kind of what comes back to how to get these six spreadsheets into one. And it's a function that's in most spreadsheet systems called pivot tables. Um, and so I'm going to get out of here, and I'm going to go look at what a pivot table looks like. Um, I'm going to, let me just, so, um, how many of you guys use spreadsheets for your crop planning or for your planning? Okay, who uses Excel? Who uses Open, open Office? Anybody use Google, Google, whatever, Sheets or whatever they call it? So my example here uses Open Office. Um, the same stuff as possible in Excel, just the formatting is a little bit different. There's actually more power in Excel than what we have in Open Office for the pivot tables. Um, so it's not going to happen in the, the same way, but you know, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, so what we have here is each row in a sheet is essentially one planting, is that right? One planting at one point in the season. And what we have on the same, on the same row is, you know, like the crop, the variety, whether it's transplanted or direct seeded. Um, am I gonna be able to, actually, I'm just gonna rechange my phrasing. So, and then as it goes down, you know, whether it's transplanted or direct seeded. And one thing that we've now used is Weeks of, like, we talk about field week as opposed to the date, so that's the 21st week of the season, um, starting from uh, January 1st. Um, you don't have to use field weeks. You can use dates if you want. Um, and then how many bed feet we plan on using, what block it's going to go into, what bed, um, the location I want to talk about, how many rows per bed, the spacing, and then a number of things that related to the greenhouse. So it's going to take spend four weeks in the greenhouse, there's one seed we're going to put per cell. We want to thin it to one, which you don't thin it at all in this case. Um, it's going to be seeded the 17th week of the year in the greenhouse. at the 1.3 safety factor, the tray size, and then how many trays it mathematically calculates and how many trays we actually want to plant. And then the same thing for potting up. So what this has is integrates all the field work and greenhouse work. And you can also have your harvest needs, how much you need to harvest and kind of work backward, into one row. 
And so it, makes, it can make it pretty burdensome when you're talking about 30 crops and 40 varieties or whatever. But what happens next is, so you can highlight the whole field. Usually in the data section, there's a part that's called pivot table. You push one that says create. And then, and this is, at this point is where Excel's a bit different, but it's the same process. So what I want is just to go to another sheet. And then each of these blocks corresponds to a row. And so I can say, I want to look at certain crops and the variety of those crops. And I want to look at what weeks in the greenhouse they are. As a so that's the rows, the columns. And then I can look at, let's see, the actual trays that are summed during the season. And this is what's going to math is going to happen. And then I push OK. And it displays for all, you know, so I only have cucumbers in the sheet, but for the cucumbers, what varieties, what weeks, how many things you need to eat to do. And so um, these are my calendars that I'm actually bringing out to the field and planning with. So on week 17, I know I need to do this. And you can have all your crops coming into this. Um, and then we, so we have a sheet that's pivoting what's going in the field. So you know, in block one, bed, block one, 102, which bed, and then what, each week how much we're planning on planting. Um, you have another pivot that's in the greenhouse, which you just looked at. And then you can do another pivot at Mads Up. Actually, I didn't look at the end of those rows. Maybe I'll do that before I do this. At the end of those rows, there's some math. There's a seed safety factor, and then there's the seeds. And it does, it adds, it multiplies everything up depending whether it's transplanted, direct, seeded. So I know how much. So I guess just to kind of see what's happening. Oh, OK. <laughs> These aren't always the most convenient for sharing with a lot of people. I'm just going to. Hide these two things. So there's a lot of the same varieties that repeat because they're planted at different times, or maybe they're planted at different spacings. And each of those varieties, you know, it adds up. If all these varieties are planted, so each variety has a different date, is going to pop up in a table like this at different spots. But in a table like with the seeds, where there's, it's not sorted by dates in the column, all the seed numbers get added together. Does that make sense? Is anybody using pivot tables for their planning? No. <laughs> so um, this is a real simple run through. And um, it's hard to, there's a lot of power that comes with this. And this is something that I am hoping to write. Uh, I have a couple blog posts worked on. And, and they'll come out in the next two months to one year. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it's. Um, it really, you know, you, there are a lot of crop planning softwares out there, but with well-developed tables, um, you can replicate a lot of the stuff, and you have a lot more flexibility than the softwares might lock you into. Um, and so this is in the case of crop planning, but you can also use this with your sales data. You can also use this with all kinds of other information. And the challenge, and this is what's in the crop planning book, doesn't have the pivot tables. It has a lot of different other things and how you build them. And the challenge with having a lot of different things is that you update something, but you forget to update somewhere else. And so with this, you're only updating one place, and it cascades everywhere else. And um, I'll get to you in a second. One other thing is, now, in our case, where we're growing 60 or 70 crops, and in some cases, we grow 5 to 10 varieties. So these sheets can be ridiculous. And I do have sheets that have three to 400 rows in them. Um, but what we tend to work with is individual sheets based around a certain block. So this is a brassica, a brassica block. Our cauliflower and broccoli and stuff will be in there. This is a salad green block. There'll be other stuff. Or maybe all the salad greens are in there, and it covers two or three blocks. So we kind of type tend to put things together. Um, sometimes that can be funny when it comes to a seed order, because at the end you have to compile seeds from a few different places. But that's that kind of one per year type thing, and that you can work with that. Um, but having, yeah, so there's different ways that you can work with it. Um, maybe there's one best way, but uh, we haven't found it yet. So you have a comment or a question? Uh, do, the, do you have a separate spreadsheet for your field maps, or is that also part of this whole? Okay, so do we have a separate sheet for our field map? Well, <coughs> that's where we have, over here, there's a column called location. So our beds, if it's a 100-foot bed, maybe at, at foot zero, Corinto starts. 
at, in, in, in bed one, and in bed one at 50 foot, market more starts. So you can use that, um, let's see if there's an easy way for me to just set that up. Um, if I just edit the layout, I could put, So in this case, so this is not specifically what you might be thinking of as a field map, but it does, this is a kind of field map where in one block, the first bed, the first 50 feet is Corinto. The next 50, or from zero to 50, it's market more. From 50 to the end is, or no, zero to 50 is Corinto. From 50 to the end is market more. And you could add another column that has the bed feet. Like you can add whatever information you want. You could have the rows per bed. So you can take this out and you can know where things are. Now, once all our planning is done, we do create visual maps that have our block laid out and we, 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 we write things in. And then when we actually plant something, we hand write so we have uh, a map. Um, and we're working towards something, that, you know, having all our 17 blocks on one sheet on the wall where there's one sheet that has everything that's planned and then one sheet that's actually there. Um, but that's not as directly entered that, that, that visual correlation. And is that referred to, is that answer? Yeah, because it's uncertified too, so we have to have the field map. Yeah, there. yeah. Um, and the field map is good, is really good for employees knowing where stuff is. So, um, what's my next slide? Or it's not, it's not a, this is not a slide. <laughs> um, so I'm going to break, get, get out of the spreadsheet program in a second. If there's any other questions about this, now would be the time to touch base on it. Okay. Okay. Um, So there's, you're, you work with Google Docs, you, uh, you said, right? Uh, or Google Sheets? Okay. So Google's a little bit different, but with Excel and OpenOffice, there's, when you, if you like right click, there's a button called refresh, and any information you've changed when you refresh will update it. With Google, in the Google Sheets, or whatever they call their, their spreadsheet, whatever you change updates automatically, so it's, uh, you don't have to accidentally print something that hasn't been refreshed. You can't update the pivot table. You update the, the core thing. So it's a one-way uh, one system. And there are some interesting things. So just a last thing. With, so here, um, or okay, let's see seeds. Pivot tables have a lot of interesting functions. Like if I double-click on this, it creates a new sheet and shows all the, the, the rows that are correlated with that blocks that I found. So you can actually generate other sheets out of that. I don't, as a rule, do that, um, but there is potential for that. But where all the work that you're doing is in your original master sheet, and so you want to lay it out in a way that's easy for you to navigate what you're, what you're doing. Um, and so sorting and doing all kinds of other data information can, can, can find that stuff. Um, uh, I mean, there's one last thing maybe I'll just show if you guys aren't familiar with it in data, and it's, it's also in, in, in Excel, there's um, something called auto filter that if you install it, you can highlight, and I just want to see the H19 little leafs, and those will pop up, or the, the market mores, and those will pop up. And so um, if you did have a 600-row sheet, this is a really good way to navigate it and avoid using sorting options to get the stuff. And that plugin's called AutoWord? No, it's, it's not a plugin. It's just a, it's just a command. It's, um, it's, a, it's under data, and it's a filter. It's auto filter. This works fantastic in Excel. In open office, it's really buggy, so um, it can work, but I've moved away from it because I, I find it buggy, and I find I can do a lot of stuff with pivot tables that I would use this with. But with Excel, it works very well. Um, and with the pivot tables, there are so many more options with the latest versions of Excel than are in open office or even Google. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I lost where I was. Thanking you guys all. Um, So, um, yeah, so with all that, you can build your crop plan. Um, that's a lot of work on your part. Um, and carry it out. And so the next steps are what you do with your crop plan. And I've kind of merged two. Um, one is you're carrying out your crop plan. You're following it from week to week. You know, you printed out your sheets. You know what you have to do each week. You do it. And you're also recording crops and sales data. Now, um, what, okay, let me just get this up here. What year, what, 
what you're hoping for is a lot of nice straight rows with no weeds, full of beautiful crops that are coming out at the right time. And then you get years where you have a foot and a half of water in your greenhouse, even though the greenhouse was built on the higher spot. Um, that's not part of the greenhouse plan. And we weren't planning on accessing the greenhouse this way. Um, and this specific year, in the summer, we never have flood problems in here. Like, we know that you build a greenhouse high. This year, you can see how much snow we have. The ground was frozen, and it got really warm at a certain point. And what we discovered is our farm is the lowest point in the whole area. So, um, and all the ditches that would evacuate the water were full. So by the afternoon, the city came out with backhoes, and they were breaking it up, and it evacuated so quick. But there was a period <laughs> where we weren't so impressed, you know, and um, we had to turn off the electrical, and, you know, it, it, took, a, it took about a week to deal with the, the furnace and all that stuff. We had some propane heaters running, and it worked out well, and it made for a great picture in a newsletter. But, but that's not what we wanted to be doing, and this kind of stuff happens all the time on the farm, sometimes more dramatic than others. And this is where, we talk about planning, planning is a 24-letter word, and this is, comes from holistic management, and planning is you're planning, you're monitoring, you're controlling, and you're replanning. And you're doing this all the time. And sometimes I get comments from people say, well, you can have this kind of thing, so why would you ever plan out your season if it can rain six inches suddenly and you can flood or you have a hailstorm that knocks things out or suddenly a market day is bad? Why, how could you ever, why would you plan it? And it's, you know, if you don't plan it, every week's going to kind of be like that. But... When you're planning, it's what you're hoping. It's not what is going to happen. And you have to be on top of things to see when things change. So the first part of the process is you plan. And we've done that. And the next part is you monitor. And this is something you have to take really seriously. And so one thing is this weather forecasts. You know, we're always looking at the seven-day forecast. Um, you know, maybe you have to take it with a grain of salt, but if there's four days of rain that are called for four inches of rain, I'm going to probably do some stuff a little bit quicker than if it looks like it's seven days dry. Regular field walks, and regular probably means weekly to most parts of the field to see how things are going. Um, you want to track when stuff is planted, um, where things are planted, and also what's selling well or what's not selling well. Any client feedback you get, you know, if the tomatoes don't taste good suddenly or there's certain bugs in the, the broccoli and you're getting a lot of comments like that, these are part of the things that you're monitoring. And then also looking at like historical data is all these things over the last few years. So if you plan a certain way and you keep getting hit at a certain point with, I don't know, your sales drop off or something, if you can see that's been done for six years, that same part, you should really, like, that, that's not something you're, you're replanning. That's part of your planning that you should, be, you should be recognizing it. So you're monitoring all these things, and then you have to control. And the control is doing something to remedy the problem in the short term and fix things. And there's no one answer to that, but you have to do it right away. And then you jump into replan. And how drastic replan is changes on what happens. If we plant out our cucumbers on May 5th, May 15th, and we're expecting, we usually don't have frost after about May 5th, but we get a frost on May 25th, we, and it hits our cucumbers and we lose three quarters of our cucumbers, we've got to do something. So as part of the control, what we might do is go and look to see if we have extra, are you trying to get my attention or? Uh, it's just a question. I'll get it, okay. Um, uh, We'll go and see if we have extra plants that were left over from that 1.3 safety factor, and we'll plug them in the holes. But then what replant is, well, so if we lost the cucumbers, we're expecting to have cucumbers as of probably like the first or second week of July, and we, sometimes we'll have seven cucumbers in a CSA share at the end of July, early August for one or two weeks. You know, it's a three or four dollar value in 300 shares, that's $12,000, that we're not going to have. And if it's just one crop, well, because of all the other safety factors, we might not care as much. But if we also lost zucchini, and we had a wet period, and, the, and it was, that was cold, and the carrots didn't germinate, and we're down three or four crops, we've got to think about what we're going to do. And so at, and when it, if it's June 1st, when this is happening, we can't seed more cucumbers. We can seed more cucumbers. We're going to get them three weeks later. 
and they're going to be, we're, we're going to be, we grow more cucumbers anyway in another wave. So those cucumbers won't catch up. So we have to think, do we want to grow more radishes? Do we want to do some microgreens? Do we want to do something else to hold, to fill that hole? And sometimes what you might also think is, sometimes what we might do is, do you want to grow more storage crops to have more stuff in the fall to give to people? But what we've discovered is trying to pad the end doesn't always work because you can have tough times in the fall too. Or you can have a bumper crop and you have so many carrots and beets that you can't harvest them and you're having to sell them at a discount to other farmers, which you know, is great to help out the community and great to sell them. But if you had just grown less, ca less carrots and beets, you wouldn't have to be moving those. So that replanting is kind of gauging how serious it is and figuring out how it works, uh, what to do with it. And this process is also, um, in a case like on our farm, where a lot of crops, like if you grow celery root, you know, we plant it in the spring. We're harvesting it in end of September, early October. There's not a lot of replanting that. If we have killer sales of celery root in the fall and we sell out, we're just going to grow more the next year, maybe. Or maybe we'll grow the same. We're just happy we sold it all. But if it turns out that um, at market or if we sell it to a restaurant and they're able to take twice as many radishes or, or bunches of arugula or coriander than we've been planning for, we can sow more to meet that demand. And that's a question that we, should, we have to ask ourselves is, do we want to meet that demand? It's not just meet that demand. And if, mar if, if, if dealing with restaurants is your third marketing outlet that's supposed to be 5% of your sales, and you have more CSA number members than usual, maybe you don't care about that demand because it's going well. But let's say you had a bad, re you had a bad recruitment program and you're down 10% your CSA members, maybe you want to milk those restaurant sales and do better. So, that's what that plan, monitor, control, replan is not just in cases of bad things. It's in cases of good things, too, is you want to always be where you're at so that your plan is, is, is updating. And at the end of the season, you do look at what your plan was and what your actual was and see how the discrepancies were and whether there's something you can expect to happen regular or whether there's something that you could have done a little bit different earlier on to to mitigate it. It's possible having some heavy row cover, getting over the, over the cucumbers would have done it. And we actually did put row cover in it, but it was so cold that we lost a lot of those cucumbers. And ultimately, it's you, your next year is another plan, time to start fresh. But again, there'll be things you're not expecting. Um, so you had a question. Yeah, well, um, more, more a comment than a question, but it seems like when you're dealing with the replanting stage, yep. um, it seems like that's where spreadsheets give a huge edge over paper and pencil because you make your plan, you want to be able to plug in numbers, right? Yeah. Especially in a case where you might have a more volatile market than a set yeah. number of CSA members? Yes. Yes. Um, I think, so I recognize that people coming into organic farming or ecological farming have a lot of different values. And some people are not interested in technology or computers and stuff. And you can do a lot of stuff with computers with, without, with paper. And you can be very precise with it. But I think to run a top-notch business, computers are a fantastic tool that can process a lot of information and respond. So I think that using spreadsheets gives you a better edge to replan and rebalance numbers and change things and save older versions that you can go back to. Um, is that correlate to what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. I'll go to you, and I, I, I see your hand up after. Yeah. When I've done similar plans, um, I've, at times, just kind of ground in spreadsheets. Yeah. Uh, where is your balance there, and how much time are you, or is, there only, is it just you, or is it just one person who's doing the spreadsheet? Building a spreadsheet? Or is everybody updating it, and how much time is devoted to that versus real work? Well, um, okay, so... And I'll just clarify the question. So the question, um, are you asking how much time do we spend managing with spreadsheets during the growing season, or how much time do we spend setting up spreadsheets in the winter? I have a year-round season. So. Okay, so you have a, yeah. Okay, and then you also had a question like how many, who's doing this planning? And so our, I'll, I'll answer for our farm quickly, but then I'll also kind of address a bit broader. Um, on our farm, we've separated out crops, different people who manage different crops, and they'll do some of the planning with the spreadsheets that are individual. And um, we're starting to centralize a little bit as our farm evolves. 
I think sort of to part of, of when to plan and when to replan, I think you do need to have a certain point where you stop and take stock of your business and you, make, you review what's happened in the past year and you make plans for the next year. And in the case of us, where we have a winter, that time is October, November, that we're gonna go back and do all that stuff and then we place, place our seed orders at the end of December so we're getting them in January. And, that, and, then, and that's awesome to have winter for that. Um, in the case where you're cropping year round, I guess I would wonder, is there a time that is crazier than other times? Yeah. And it, what is that time? Okay. And, uh, December, yeah. So it's slower. You're so on your farm. It's slower in August, September, and January. No. Or, uh, September's uh, crazy. Okay. Do, so do you, August and January. August and January. So, you. I would probably choose one of those two times, and it might also be related to when your financial year end is, and that might be a way to set your financial year end. Um, to to choose one of those places where you tear apart your business. And you maybe meet once a week with, you know, if you have a farm partner or employees or whoever the management team is, meet once a week to tear apart different stuff and then have maybe somebody rebuilding it. Um, this planning, it's kind of like you have to go away, do the thinking, you know, have the realization, come back and carry it out. Because this planning is what controls everything else. And it's possible that in a case where if you really have a very slow August and a very slow January, maybe you have two types of planning. One of those times is the really big picture where you're looking at everything, and that includes planning for the next six months or the next eight months or whatever. And then the next time, you're not looking at everything, but you do do a replanning based on last, the last chunk of trends, what's happening. And I think that the time that you spend, and I, I think that Curtis is speaking about crunching numbers this afternoon, so that's one of the reasons I'm not going too much into spreadsheets, but I think the time that you spend analyzing your data, so, not, so creating the data is very important, but the time you spend analyzing and understanding your data okay. is the most valuable time on your farm. Because if you can discover that you don't need to do a certain thing to generate revenue, or that's something that's unprofitable, you can cut it out, that makes so much more money than going out and hand weeding carrots that have gone out of control. And so that analysis is, is the linchpin of, of, of your farm. And that, if you can find a way to do one to two hours of looking at numbers a week, it's going to make everything easier. It's the same way as if you can enter your, your receipts and you do your bookkeeping on a weekly basis as opposed to waiting you know, every three months. It's just easier to process. Analyzing the data, and you know, for CSA, it might, if, what kind of marketing do you do? Um, this has been over the course of a couple different types of projects. Right now, I'm on the smallest project I've had, which is about three acres. When it, I was really heavily doing a lot of spreadsheet work, it was for 200 acres, and it was all vegetable production. And how was it marketed? Uh, CSA, farmers markets, and restaurant delivery. Did some of the demand change a lot, or was it? it? I wasn't the owner of the farm. Okay. And so the direction was just produce by volume. Right. Um, so yes, the demand would change, but they would just take it at a loss. Okay. So in this, in this, in this, this I'm repeating for the, for the for the camera. So in this context, you were working on a farm that had quite a large acreage, and had a lot of different ways that they were selling, including market, including restaurant but they were just producing volume and then selling what they could as opposed to knowing what the demand is and then growing for that. Yeah. yeah. And, and for some stuff like if you're doing long season crops, that's kind of a way that you're kind of stuck a bit. You can't start those long season crops on the short term unless it's a baby long season crop. But something like, like, like lettuce or carrots or beets, and it's like microgreens and lettuce, you can respond, uh, uh, salad greens, you can respond much quicker. And if you have a CSA and you've been running for a bit, you generally know what people like, so you don't have to be on top of it the same way. But if you have, if you're dealing with, with wholesale clients, I think you really, it's great to be on top. And that's where that regular analysis really makes a difference. And the farmer's market is somewhere in between. Um, it is good to know what your trends are, but you can probably count on a little bit more normalness. Yeah. Um, so there's another question here. Yeah. Um, sorry if I missed this, but um, 
Are you tracking on this on these same sheets your use of water, compost, and other? We have, we have. We have a system that's the plan and a system that's actuals. So when we're actually planting something, it'll be a different sheet that we update. We want to keep those two sheets separate. Um, something like a compost application, we have a separate sheet that, that we're taking care of that. Um, so not everything is in one place, but not everything has to be in one place. Because for when we pl what we actually plant, we do want to be able to go back and look at and have a correlation for our yield information. When we plant compost, when we, when, plant compost, when we spread compost, we generally want to have that for accountability, like for the certifier. And it's just good to know when you've done things, but you're not looking at that 10 times a year. You're looking at that once, maybe, or every time you fill it out. Okay. Um, so the next step up, after you've gone through you know, your crop planning it's, and you have some data, um, you want to analyze crop profitability. So what makes a crop profitable? You guys want to tell me what makes a crop profitable? Being able to sell it. Being able to sell it. So demand. Anything else? Um, cost to produce is less than what you get back. So the cost is less than the, the price, I guess? Yeah. Days to maturity. Anything else make it profitable? What's that? Okay, the, the, the yield, yeah. The amount of producers, so the yield, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so these are all part of it. Um, ultimately, you need to make a crop budget, and it's sort of this part here, you know. The income, or the expense, the income minus the expenses creates your profit. <coughs> and to really know the cost of production of an item, you have to keep track of all the ways you're generating revenue from it, <coughs> um, and then subtract all the associated expenses, perhaps including labor, maybe your labor or others, and you get a profit from that. And that gives you a total, like a, a real idea whether that crop is profitable or not. And you know, in rent and overhead will be just a portion of that in the expenses. And if you have the systems and the time to do this, this tool is invaluable. And there's some great farms, book, great, great, great books that deal with that. Richard Wiswall's The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook has some great tools for that, and he has all his crop budgets. And there's Fearless Farm Finances. It also has some stuff with that, but also a lot of stuff with QuickBooks. And so they're great tools. And this is not what I'm going to show you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and we do do some, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but most farmers don't have the patience or the systems to really get down to the nitty gritty for all their crops. And there's two benchmarks that we use to see what's profitable. We look at the space it takes to grow and the time it takes to harvest and post-harvest. So, so in the case of a space, we want to set a target, calculate our yield, and then compare that with the target to see what the profitability is. So again, I'm not going to explain it again, but the bed foot and the row foot. So we start off by, you know, to know your target, you have to know how much you want to generate. So this goes back to that goal in step one, that gross sales goal. So if you want to make $22,000 and you have five, six of an acre that's in cropped, so this is what's actually in vegetables, not including your cover cropped or, or your paths or your green, or, or maybe greenhouse, but you need to make about $26,000 an acre, um, which is not so bad. And if I, based on the numbers you've been hearing the last couple of days, this is on the low end. Um, if down the line you want to make $80,000 and you decide you're going to increase your acreage, you've got two acres, you need to make $40,000 an acre. Now maybe you say, I'm just going to use the same space, so you need to make $65,000 an acre. Or you say, I've been really inspired by all these talks and I'm going to get smaller, so I'm going to make more money from less land. So in this case, you need to make $320,000 an acre. What's really important here is the gross sales is the same in all three of these. It's just how much space you're using to do that. And so it means that if you have a lot of acreage, you don't have to be focusing on crops that are like making, like making a lot of money. Sure, 100 acres at this sounds fantastic, but this is going to be a lot of work. But 
if you have a low acreage and you have a bunch of stuff at $10,000 an acre, you're just never going to be able to make this. So one of the takeaways from this is that your scale dictates what crops are profitable for you. And um, so you have to be careful when you're talking about a system being not profitable or profitable because it really depends on all these variables. And this number here, this ratio, is what you need to be working with. And in this case, this is the total dollars per acre generated off of an area in a year. So there's not a lot of crops that generate this with one harvest. This might have to be four crops of $80,000 an acre to do it. There's quite a bit that you can do $4,000 an acre. And so it might mean that in a system where you're doing more acreage, you don't have to do a lot of succession planting. You can grow more extensively. But on a lower system, succession planting will be a key component for it. Um, where am I going with that next? Now, it's really hard to think about dollars per acre when you're growing five feet of cilantro or something, you know? So we'll convert this by, this is how much dollars per acre we're looking for. The bed width, so this is again from one path, uh, middle of one path to another middle of the path, divided by the number of square feet per acre means that this is about $3 a bed foot. So if you can get $3 out of a bed foot, you're hitting that target. And so this converts here to, on a five-foot bed width, $60,000 is about seven fifty. dollars $40,000 is about $5, $20,000 is about two fifty dollars a bed foot. Um, so they're quick benchmarks. Could you go back to the other one? I would be happy to. <laughs> okay, can I change? <laughs> um, so, any questions about kind of this process? Okay, so this is sort of benchmarks, and it's really important to remember this is on a five-foot bed width. In the case of Jean Martin, what he was talking with yesterday with 30 inches and I think 12-inch paths, that's like, um, uh, that's like a three-and-a-half-foot bed width. So the numbers would not correlate the same way. So to calculate your yield, you got to look at how much you harvested, so let's say it's 476 lettuce heads, out of a certain number of bed feet gives you a yield. And you can project what you're going to do if you know that I have so many lettuce heads and I, multi and I sell at this, I can get something. But you can also work with what you actually harvested and sold. And so from here, taking the yield multiplied by the price gives you the bed feet. So this yield here gives you almost, four, almost $5 a bed foot. So this is just shy of $40,000 an acre. So this kind of crop here on the acreage you were talking about could generate $22,000, and that makes sense. Um, in the case of a $320,000 acre you're looking for, you're gonna need like eight more crops like this to get to it. Now, with this, you can change your price and sell more crop. And generally, once your system is well set up, your yield is harder to improve, and the price is what has a bigger impact on your system. And that's where getting price right really makes a difference. But, so here, we have three rows per bed. This is how we crop in our field, and it's so that we can get through with the cultivating tractor and weed the beds. Um, if you saw Jean Martin's pictures, they didn't look like this yesterday. In our greenhouse, for head lettuce, we tend to have it about four rows per bed. Um, we're working with hand tools. Um, this is our salad greens, kind of salad nova and some other stuff, but there's seven rows per bed. And in some cases, those form nice heads. And what Jean Martin was talking about yesterday about not getting disease in this, we get disease in this. So we do not crop our head lettuce out like this. We're cropping smaller stuff that's cutting regularly, so there's a lot more ventilation. But let's say you can get seven rows per bed in there and you don't have disease that's a much higher potential yield than we're looking at three beds. And so when you get to the numbers, if you can get five heads per bed, so maybe there's seven rows, but you're going to lose a couple. If you get on average five heads per bed at two bucks a bed, two bucks a head, you're at $10 a bed foot. 
This is way more interesting than the first set. And so that's $80,000 an acre. You need four crops like that to get where you're going. You could also reduce, increase the price, and it's going to be even more profitable. But you could also reduce the price. And so here, dropping to 150 a head, if you're getting these five heads per bed feet, you're still higher than what this value is. And it can make you more appealing to selling in wholesale or restaurants or even farmer's markets. Maybe not so popular in farmer's markets where you're undercutting everybody, <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but, you know, it is a free market. <laughs> um, now, the difference between this and this is you have to have good weed control here from the start. You might do some cultivation with, uh, with the hoe, but you're not getting there with a the tractor probably. Um, you also have to have low disease incidence. So these are different systems. Um, and um, those end results sure look nicer here, but it has to work for them to go there. And in these cases, this probably would work, if it's working well, these are the kind of cases you want in a system that you're looking for $320,000 an acre, uh, which is very high, very profitable, not impossible, but very profitable. Um, so if you look at, there's three crops here, sugar snap peas, broccoli, cilantro, total amount harvested from a certain bed feet. And these are sort of accurate numbers. So if you divide the harvest by the bed feet, you get 0.35 pounds per bed foot. If you multiply by a price, let's say $5 a, bed, a pound, you might be seeing them seven or eight bucks a pound, but let's say when the slide was made, it was five bucks a pound, that gives you 175 a bed foot. This is less than $20,000 an acre. This is not gonna get you a lot far on a low acreage. Now, if you have 20 acres, this might make sense, but on a low acreage, it doesn't get very far. And that comes down to 15K an acre. Broccoli, you know, $3 a head, coming out 25K an acre. Cilantro, 48 bunches out of 12 feet, that's coming at $67,000 an acre. And that's at two bucks a bunch, which might be low. Um, and I don't think that's a crazy yield. So you can see there's a diversity here. Now, this is not the only three crops that we have out there, but the, it is a broad range. How much cilantro can you sell? It's harder to know, but arugula, thyme, oregano, a lot of crops can work like this. And if you can have a bit broad range of crops that you can sell at these prices, you need a lot less space. Um, it's also important to, well, let's just see what my next slide is. So as a general rule, the most profitable crops in space are bunch herbs and greens, you know, things that you can cut and then they regrow. Somewhat profitable in space is bunched roots like carrots or beets, lettuce heads. These are things that take, they take up a small space, but they don't regrow. The less profitable in space, beans, peas, broccoli just takes a lot of space, potatoes can take a lot of space, but a key part in this is price. If you're selling potatoes at a dollar a pound, you might be making something like $15,000 an acre. If you can sell them at $4 a pound, you might be at, at $50,000 an acre. And so that might be, you just have a, a market that's dying for p potatoes. These kind of, you know, fresh organic potatoes taste so much better than what you're getting in the grocery store. So there might be a potential there. If you have fingerlings or different color potatoes that yield well, it can make sense. Um, and about making sense, it's again, low acreage, you need this. High acreage, you're probably in this. Like, or large acreage, you're probably in this. So, um, did we already look at this? Yeah, we did. Okay. And I would just kind of come into a cup of double cropping. Curtis talks about his buy and high rotation crops in his, in his talks. Is those values stack? So if you have $15,000 an acre coming out of uh, peas, but then you follow it with $67,000 an acre of cilantro, you're looking at $80,000 an acre. So that can be a way to justify having peas. A lot of people claim that peas are good to have early in the season when you don't have a lot of other stuff. People like to come to them. But if you're not making money, you're not making money. So um, you got to be careful that where you're not making money is really reduced to where it doesn't hurt you. But understand that reducing it further is going to make more money for you elsewhere. So the other part is time. That's the other thing that we're lacking on the farm. And um, Again, you want to set targets, calculate profitability. And so this is based on 
a set of assumptions, which may or may not be accurate, <laughs> depending on what farm you're on. But what I see on a lot of small farms, about 20% of the time is spent establishing a crop. So that may be in the greenhouse, that's planting. About 20% is maintaining the crop. So that would be weeding, trellising, all that kind of stuff. About 20% is in your harvest and your post-harvest. About 20% is actually selling it. And 20% is like all that crop planning we're talking about, machinery maintenance and, and other things. And in this example, this is the only place you make money is when you sell the crop. So 20% of your, 100% of your revenue has to be generated in this 20% of your time. And you can only sell what you harvest, unless you're doing resale, but that's a different thing. But so you have to harvest 100% of your sales in 20% of your time. Now for sure, these numbers might be different, but if it's 50%, it's you're harvesting 100% of your revenue in 50% of your time. But this here, when you're averaging out over a growing season, if you think about when you, on an, uh, and this is maybe not true on a farm where you're doing a lot of four week crop, four week days to maturity crops that are being quick rotation, but if you're growing 20 or 30 crops and your marketing season is starting in kind of mid June, running until October, this is very true because you spend so much time establishing before you actually harvest. And then there's a lot of time that's spent um, taking down at the end. So, as a farmer, a full-time farmer, you might be working 2,000 hours over the season. So 20% of your time would be about 400 harvest hours. And that's where you have to generate the revenue. So if you want to make $22,000 a year, and you're two people and you have 800 harvest hours, you have to be picking and washing at at least $2,750 an hour. And that's not very high, but you're also not making that much money. If you are making $60,000 a year, you've got to go up to $75,000, $75 an hour. And um, if you're making a lot more, and, and this is at the same harvest time. Um, so to see what that looks like, um, let's, okay, so if you can harvest 54 carrot bunches in a, a total, and you're getting 250 a carrot bunch, and that takes three hours, so it might be three hours for one person or one and a half hours for two people, that comes about $45 an hour, which meets that first goal, but not the second goal. And if all your crops are like this, you will not be able to generate enough revenue unless you can increase the harvest time that you put into. And that would mean reducing your weeding and reducing something else. Now, you can raise the price like we did before. So you can have $3 a bunch, and it raises it somewhat, but not a huge amount. You can also increase how quick you harvest and wash. So if you're able to drop it to two hours, that has a much bigger impact on your, 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 your profitability. Do I have another screen? Yeah. And then if you can raise your price and reduce your time, you're doing better. So in this specific case, it's come to $81 an hour. And um, so, you know, price, that's what the market can bear. This here is technique and skill. And that's where I find if you've worked on a good market, market farm, you can harvest two to three to four times faster than somebody who's never worked on a market farm, unless they're like amazingly intuitive. And that's where spending a season harvesting different vegetables really pays off, that you can re get much more for the same amount of harvest time as somebody who's, who, who, who's, who's struggling essentially to get there. Um, so, um, yeah, so to improve harvest efficiency, other than spending a couple seasons on a farm, um, keep weeds under control. If you have to fight with weeds to get to the crop you're harvesting, it's going to slow you down. Bring everything you need to the field. If you have to go back because you need more rubber bands, that walking time, it <laughs> increases your time. You break your harvest tasks into steps. You know, don't be kind of, like if you're doing carrots, maybe you pull them out, one person, pull, one person forks them, one person pulls them, puts them on the ground in a bunch, another person picks them up and puts the elastic on them into a pile, and another person puts them in a bin. And maybe those four people are one people, doing it one after the other, you, you fork everything, you pull everything, you bunch everything, 
you, uh, you pack up everything, but it could also be a couple people that are, that are rotating through those tasks. Um, fill your hands before returning them to your bin. So if you're doing beans and you pick one bean and put it in your bin and another bean and put it in your bin, the numbers I'm going to show for beans are way too high. <laughs> but if you're able to get, you know, fill up your whole hand before you put it in a bin, you're going to be doing better. And that's true for like tomatoes also. You know, you don't want it, like you want to have two tomatoes in each hand when you're putting in your bin if they're big tomatoes. If it's cherry tomatoes, it might be more than that that you want to have in your hand before you put it up to your bin. And sharpen your harvest tools regularly. A sharp knife cuts so much more fast or so much faster than a dull knife. And, um, and with this kind of approach, it's night and day what you can achieve. And it's really important to increase this area because this is what's generating the revenue. And the more time that you can spend, well, the more time you spend harvesting, the more you generate, but also the more efficient you are in your harvest, you more generate. So if you can increase both the amount you harvest and the amount of efficiency, then you're doing great. Um, so just looking at these same three crops and the amount of time it might take to harvest them and the math that goes through it. So something like sugar snap peas, maybe you're harvesting at $40 an hour. Broccoli, maybe $120 an hour. Cilantro, $192 an hour. Um, these two are totally in what's reasonable. This can be reasonable, but it tends to be in a low pay, when you have low paid labor, and low paid might just be minimum wage, which might be happy for some people, but it might also be lower than that, um, where this kind of stuff makes sense. Um, and um, yeah, so crops that are really profitable in time are often herbs, greens, where you can kind of cut something, throw an elastic around it, and just get it to market, like chard or kale. Um, lettuce heads, you know, a cut, put it into a bin. Something like salad greens might more be in the middle because you're cutting it, you're bringing it somewhere, there might be washing, there might be another bag up step. And that's what the profitable in time, some of these crops, they do generate a lot, you can handle it, but it's just the number of times you handle is what's lowering that profitability. And then the least profitable in time tends to be beans and peas. And this is just, it just takes a lot. I have known some bean pickers and some pea pickers who can pick it so that they're above this. But that is the exception. <laughs> it's very few people that can pick that fast. And there's very few tricks that I can give you to pick that fast. Um, so, um, is there a question? Well, volunteers can be a way to do it. Um, but you could have volunteers picking stuff like this, maybe, instead. You know, it's, uh, but yeah. Yeah. So some CSAs do have a pick your own for beans and peas, and sometimes they also have cherry tomatoes there, and maybe raspberries and strawberries, things that, I mean, and, and cherry tomatoes are definitely in this area here, but if you don't have to harvest them, it's great. But um, to kind of go back, you know, something like sugar snap peas, they're low profitability in time, so replacing that, that's one thing. But the low profitability in acre, acreage also. And beans and peas are hard to justify in a small acreage unless it's just you need to have them to hit certain markets. But you want to reduce the amount of time that you're spending with them and the amount of acreage that you're growing them to just what you need because you're essentially losing money. And you're wasting time that could be spent on something that's generating more money. Um, so... Um, and I do think Jean Martin uh, and Modelin grow a certain amount of sugar snap peas, but they do have a CSA. I don't think these are high for Curtis Stone, unless you're talking about a microgreen, but something different. Um, so, just there are crops that are profitable in time and space. Some are more profitable in space or time, and some are profitable in neither. And the more you have down here, the less money you're making. And it really is worth thinking through whether these need to be part of your farm operation. Um, if you can have a profitable farm that does include them, but they're not where you're making your money. So coming back to crop budgets. So these are benchmarks I talked about so far. And 
you know, you're not talking about weeding. I'm not talking about harvest time. I'm not talking about duration of time in the field. Um, and these are things that Curtis mentioned yesterday, and I think he might mention again this afternoon. And those all come in, but this is just these two benchmarks of looking at. And I find that they're a really good way, and they line up with a lot of other information. And so this is fantastic to do, these crop budgets. And I have friends who've done a lot of them, and when we look at them, most of the time, if I use these other, other benchmarks, I come to the same results as what they're doing. Now, one, we've begun to do more of these. And so we sell a lot of garlic. We sell about one-eighth of our sales as garlic. Um, we spend a lot of time on garlic. So we started to, uh, two years ago, we started tracking everything that we did in the garlic. And we made a crop budget. And it came out profitable, which we were happy to see. But one of the things that we saw was where we were spending, spending labor. And, you know, we kind of thought this was where a lot of work was happening. But what we realized, we spent as much time harvesting as hanging garlic on the wall. And this blew me away. And so what a crop budget does is shows you where you're doing things, and it shows you where you can improve stuff. And, I mean, ultimately, if you can cut everything out other than plant and harvest, you're going to be more profitable. And that's, that's fantastic, but it's hard to get there, but not impossible. And, you know, when you're dealing with a lot of quick turnover crops, that's what you're striving for is just plant and harvest. But if you have a lot of other steps, the crop budget helps highlight where you're doing them. So... We don't quite have a, we've, we've, we've already reduced the harvest of the hanging time for garlic. There's more we're planning on reducing this, this coming summer. But you can't modify things. You can't improve the things if you don't know it's a problem. And you can't really know it's a problem if you don't measure it. Um, and sometimes you can be really surprised how well something's doing. But in this case, I would say focus on the crops that you're making the most money off of. Or the crops you're spending the most time on. And I hope they're the same crops. Um, because improving those things, if you can improve something that's a quarter of your sales or half of your sales by 10%, that's a much bigger return than improving something that's only 10% of your sales. So, um, yeah, cleaning garlic with a toothbrush is something we also do. And I've seen a big difference in, well, I'm not even getting into that. Um, there's another, this is back on the crop budgets uh, or just how you value crop. So we sell, the, the caliber of garlic that goes in our garlic braids, our garlic bunches, is about $2, $2 a bulb. We put 10 in a bunch, so that comes to $20 a braid of garlic. When we make a garlic braid like this, we add five bucks to it to, comment, to, to, to be the price, to the price of the braiding. And at the speed we braid, it's profitable for us, because we can do about 20 or more braids, braids an hour. Um, however, we've been, running, we've been selling out of all of our garlic. And we don't have a ton of time, even if it's profitable time, not a time to do it. So we decided last year, or maybe two years ago, is this right? Yeah, to start selling the garlic, not in a bunch. Um, still a long stem, but not in a bunch. And at first we thought, okay, we'll just sell them $2 a bunch. And we decided, no, we're going to sell them. So by not selling, selling them in a bunch, you know, we make a little bit less money, but you're saving the work. But then we decided to sell them at the same price, whether they're in a bunch or not. And we sold them all. So... We managed to save a lot of labor and still sell all our garlic at the same amount. And so those are things to look at how you can cut certain steps of, uh, of what you're doing. And if you have a crop, if you, if you can't keep up with supply or demand, if you can't keep up with demand, you have many more options than if your supply is overabundant. Um, so, and this brings us to the end of the cycle. When you start to plan for next year, and what do I have here? Yes, yeah, so all the steps you should do again. But as you do a second year of crop planning, you have the first year to compare with. And that can give you a much more educated uh, guess. Um, and, you know, until you've gone through one crop planning cycle, it's still relatively a rough draft. And it takes a few years to get something that works well. Um, it's still worth doing the effort to kind of think through, the prob think through it and eliminate early problems. Well, you can also start to find, as you do more crop planning, that you might be able to crop plant a little bit less at certain times of the year. And certain, like you might want to focus where there's, it's, it's tougher, there's not enough labor, or um, just there's less produce available. But you might start to be able to get to some kind of default systems 
that, 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 that work for you without doing two or three weeks of number crunching in the winter. Though the analysis is still pretty important. And so this brings us to the conclusion, which is what we're trying to do when we crop plan is we want a farm that provides a good quality of life. We want to provide a living age to the owners, and I, I would really stress the workers, because once you start relying on labor, you could not hit the same targets if you didn't have that labor. And it's, um, and, uh, you know, your labor is going to stay with you if you treat them well and you pay them well, and um, you're going to be able to work better. And then the last thing is you're also trying to maintain and improve the agroecological system. So these are the things that we're hoping that we get out of our crop plan. It's not that we want to know, it, it's not the 20 bunches of carrots that we want on week seven, or that, that, that's the goal, though it's part of the process. This is the goal. And you're trying to figure out where you can reduce work so that you're able to hit your targets and your financial targets and, um, and also not work too hard. Um, so on that, I would say thank you for getting through this two and a half hours with no bathroom break. Um, if you want to find out more about our website, or about us, we have a website, thelmatolnasal.qc.ca. This is in English and in French, so you guys don't have to worry about not being able to read it, unless, unless you speak French also. Um, or I guess unless you don't speak English or French. Um, and then we have our, this is my blog, goingtoseed.wordpress.com, which is in English. I write predominantly about seed, but also about small farming. And I am working towards publishing a series of articles on pivot tables. So that's where you'll find that information. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so I think, um, I guess, thank you. And we have half an hour now where maybe we could do a quick return first on these questions, and then we can answer new questions that may have come up about anything. <laughs> Does that sound good? So how much seed to order? Can you go back to that one slide just so I can get it? I would love to. It doesn't, it's, I might just escape. So this side here, or the, there's also this slide here. Okay, so this slide here is just how to convert. Yeah, so I'll just check this one off. Does that work for you? Okay. Um, the six spreadsheets with the pivot tables, that's kind of the tool. Is, it, is this, do you think it'll, like, I know you, you, said, you said you're already doing pivot tables. Um, what six spreadsheets are you dealing with? I have a separate spreadsheet to calculate what I'm going to need for my yep. shares. Yep. And, and for wholesale and restaurants, so it's all incorporated. Then I that's, so it's one sheet that has all those needs? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The big monster one, kind of like what yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so there's a, a spreadsheet that's based around the market needs, so farmer's markets, CSA, or all, all the different orders. Another spreadsheet that's based around crop planning and seed order. And then the other one's on our field maps. Okay. Um, to get them out to the field in terms of where we're going to put them. Yeah. So and then the third one is field maps. Um, are there more with six kind of like a, uh, a just a general number thrown out? It's a general number, but then I do, I do lots of auto filter because of Excel, which I love. Yeah. And then I create the transplant log for the greenhouse. I create... So that's your record keeping is the other part. That's some more sheets then? Um, the record keeping, yeah, it's completely separate. Yeah. We do in Google Docs um, yeah. for harvest logs. Yeah. And then try and combine them all together to analyze the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, and it might be that some, uh, so it sounds like you already have a pretty good integrated system here, because usually it's here that people have a hard time integrating. So you seem to already have integrated there. With the location numbers I was showing, it's a certain way that you can integrate here, but it doesn't quite give you the same visual as a, as a total field map. Um, you know, from here to here, you, 
there's a couple things that you can do if you really want to integrate them. Is there's like some if functions. Is, are you familiar with that? So that's, and I'm, I'm not going to tell a lot of, there's a lot of functions, but just some if it's like this and then, you know, the stuff in it. And I think it's, you know, what the, I'm not sure, it basically, what it does is if you have um, a spreadsheet with, you know, different crops here and different things here, and you have another spreadsheet with one crop here, what the sum if does is it looks at, I think the first variable is what this value is, and then it looks at everything in this row to find out what those are, and then it sums up all the ones that correlate in this row to this. So it's one way that you can have information coming from one place to another, and you can, you can reference another sheet with it. Um, going, so this, going, linking these guys together in a case where you have a lot of whole season crops isn't as important. Linking these guys together is really important when you have a lot of high turnover crops. So what Chris Thoreau is talking about with, he has like, I don't know, like a two or three week crop cycle, and people are changing numbers, and he has, I don't know, 30 or 40 accounts. This has to be dynamic, this information. A lot of the other information doesn't have to be dynamic. Now, on the record keeping side, tracking, like, having some of the information follow your sheets can help it so that you don't have to go back and integrate it. So if you know that a specific block, if you, if you say have 300 feet of a specific cucumber variety, maybe that in your sheets that have the cucumber, you know, has a cucumber name, the bed feet, and then when you're entering the harvest data and the date, you already have the bed feet there. So, you're, so it's like maybe you export something this way, and this is what you're going to be using later on to do your analysis. You're not trying to m m m m merge a lot of stuff together. Does that make sense? Okay, we could talk about it more. But, um, yeah. Um, any other comments about sort of linking spreadsheets or concerns or desires that people have? Something that would be nice in my mind is like, so in this format, you go from developing your, your sales projections and then to the fields. Yes. But my mind kind of works the opposite, where I look at the field and then figure out the successions I can get in the bed and then figure out the, the yields I can get from that. Yeah, and there, there, in reality, there kind of is a little bit of back and forth that happens. But, um, um, but if you don't have your sales driving the rest of it, you're growing crop that you're trying to find a way to sell. So the back and forth that's really important is if you start off with this and you figure out your crop plan and you have an acre and a half in your crop plan, but you only have half an acre, you got to figure out how to make that work. And it might be that you can stack more, more, multi, more succession cropping, but it's probably also that maybe you shouldn't be growing certain crops and maybe you should be changing your mix a bit. And so whereas if you start the other way, you start with what you'd like to grow on the space that you have, you figure something out, and then it's how am I going to sell that? And there is a bit of value to that. Like if you're only doing CSA, you might only want to have full beds of onions, so you, and you know that I want a full block of onions. It's going to create this on, that's onions. So if we can give two pounds of onions every week, it works out. And that might work well for a rotation. But for the most part, starting with your sales projection and going backward will get the tightest. Um, and um, yeah, is that, or? Yeah, that yeah, no, it's a good place to start. But like you kind of already have an idea of where you can take stuff. Like say you basically have a limitless farmer's market. Yeah. Hypothetically, obviously. Um, then if you plan like when you plant stuff, then you can see like what your maximum yields can be and then figure out the source. Well, if you have a limitless farmer's market, the first thing is limitless for what? Is it for all crops? So, and then if you have a limitless farmer's market for the highest profit crops, you probably want to kind of tweak towards there. And there's a little bit of building up, but in the end, it's, there's nothing that's limitless. <laughs> and, and, and I think that that's a lot of what someone like Curtis and Chris Thoreau have done 
is figuring out what the best profitable stuff is. And it's a little bit of a different kind of crop planning because they might be crop planning. And, and, and Chris t mentions this, he's doing weekly crop planning. So whereas if you're dealing with CSA and farmer's market for most crops, annual crop planning works out. Or in some cases, if you do have a year-round season, twice a year crop planning might work out. In some of these crops, it, weekly crop planning is what you want to do because um, you don't want to get stuck with four beds of arugula when somebody only, you can only sell one and you could have sold three beds of something else. So it is a good thought experiment to go through, but when you get down to the planning, you really want the market to be driving what you're growing. Unless you want to develop a market for something and you're like, you're, 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 this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to sell it. But I think if you're dealing with microgreens or quick growing stuff, you're going to just have a lot of waste. Um, yeah. So I'm going to move along. Um, so succession cropping of what follows what. And I think this was in a Mexican context. So what follows what depends how long things take and how much residue a crop leaves in the ground. Um, so when I talk about residue is if you have arugula that you're harvesting at a baby stage and then you cut it down, you can almost plant straight into that. Maybe I want to turn the soil a little bit, but there's not a lot of residue. If you have corn that has six foot tall stalks and you go through and mow it, you have the residue from the plant and then you have the root balls that are still in there. And so you can't just simply go and direct seed arugula through that or carrots. You're going to have to turn the soil. And, so, and if you really wanted to direct seed something, you have to do a deep plow to get all that residue low. Um, but if you just rototill it in, if you put something like broccoli after, which could transplant in, that decomposing corn matter is going to lock up a lot of the nitrogen. So that's... Is that... Is that people follow that? <laughs> So the two things that you're looking at is residue, is this the right thing? And I'd say time to maturity, or maybe DTM. And you have to have enough time for the crop to mature. And in your off seasons, it takes longer for the crop to mature, so you should account for that. Um, and then um, you also might, I guess, additional fertility is a consideration. If you have a system where you can keep adding fertility, then you don't have to worry about having high fertility things following each other. But if you don't have a good source of fertility, and you're only putting it once a year, you might want to have more stuff that's a lower or medium fertility. And um, the systems where this works the best is stuff that's like carrots, lettuce, salad greens, maybe carrots, maybe like bush beans. But something like, I guess, something like, Broccoli could follow some of these crops, but you probably wouldn't want to put broccoli beforehand because it has a lot of residue also. Um, uh, yeah. Do you have a more specific question that comes out of that, or is that? Okay. So how to plan your crops in a developing market. So um, I guess the first thing that I've stated so far is it's good to do the mental exercise, kind of like you do, do the mental exercise of starting from your field up. It's also doing the mental exercise of what your market would look like if you could sell the things that you want to sell in it or the things that you expect can be there. And so to get those numbers, you could just make them up. <laughs> but if you sold for another farmer in a similar type of market, you might know that this kind of market can handle 100 bunches of carrots a week. So you might start with some educated guesses. Sometimes you can ask... Um, established growers. Maybe they'll tell you, maybe they won't. Um, so that's kind of one place to do it. Um, but what it comes down to is you only know what you can sell based on bringing it and people buying it. And there's part of, there's, there's, there's sort of two approaches to going to market. One is you don't want to come back with unsold product because it correlates to extra labor that, that was wasted. The other thing is you also don't want to leave money on the table. And so if you sold everything out, that means you could have maybe sold more. So coming back with 5 or 10% means that 
you've reached that potential more and you can kind of see where that potential is. So the balance of that. And I think if you have 40 crops and you're coming back with 10% of each, you've got a problem. But if you're coming back with five or 10 of them at 10% and most of the stuff is selling out, then that's okay. And so what happens is you kind of start with a plan <laughs> and you grow it out and then you... I mean, your, your first couple markets, if, if, if you haven't been to this market and you're not experienced with markets, your first couple markets are, you're just guessing, you know? And they're probably not going to be the kind of story where you come home with 3,000 bucks and this is the best thing ever. It's probably going to be table with a pile of bok choy and lettuce and you sold 100 bucks and you stood a long time and then maybe at the end you trade it for some bread, you know? And, and most farmers have stories like that, and hopefully it's just one or two weeks, and it's not 25 weeks. Um, but so you kind of have to do a little bit of time where, you, in the farmer's market contest, you have to do a little bit of time where you might not be selling stuff, and you're, you are to your like, and you are building the market. In a CSA and in wholesale, it's different, because wholesale, you know, you, you should be harvesting to your order. You shouldn't be harvesting and then try to sell it. Um, with CSA, you know how many people you've planned for. So if you plan for 20 people and you get 20 people, you've got to just make sure your plan is on track. If you plan for 20 people and you sell 40, 40, 40 shares, well, then you should probably grow more stuff or you're asking for trouble. Um, so it's really the farmer's market case where you have to be willing to put a bit of time in to start getting the feel of it. And this is really where... Um, Top-notch quality, good branding, and like a good personality can go a long way to, to, to develop quickly. But my experience in farmer's markets is that unless you start off at like a killer amount right away, usually every week is better than the week before. And then sometimes the autumn will drop down a bit, and the next year, often you're starting off earlier, you're starting off better than you were finishing and you keep going. And it tends to be that way for two, three years until you start to plateau. And, and that's kind of part of it is you're learning, because you might have your plan, but you can't actually get everything to market. You know? So it takes you a few years to start to consistently have the stuff you want and to maintain the supply of the things that you want to sell. It takes you time to be able to establish relationships with people and for people to start to have you be their go-to person. When you're new to a market, People have their favorite vendors, but if their favorite vendors have long lines, they might dabble with the other products. But if you're consistently great and you're a fun person to deal with, you become their favorite vendor. And, the, and so it's a nice position to be to build relationships, not necessarily to make money, but to build relationships as the underdog. And over time, you can build yourself up, and then you'll start to see it as people taking your clients away. And um, so it's a little bit of patience and, and good product. Um, does that correlate to, or is there, is there something more specific you'd like to ask about that? Well, just, just to sum up, is, is what you're saying as simple as, especially for a more volatile market like a farmer's market where um, you know, your, your sales would probably grow over time and it takes time to develop that, are you basically saying make a good projection and analyze your past sales and, and adjust accordingly? I, I guess I'm sort of saying that, and what I would add in is if you're only selling at farmer's market, Maybe make sure you have a bit of savings, <laughs> and um, it's um, and it, and this is where your crop choice is. If you're growing a lot of long season crops, then you're really banking on something. If you're growing a lot of quick return crops, you start a certain way and you adjust. If things are going worse than you think, you grow less. If things are going or you do more more you do more work, if um, to sell, and if they're growing better, you grow more. Um, so that's kind of that correlation, but like, and I guess I, w I would stress the, I, you know, so you've, hear, you've heard numbers this weekend of, you know, making $100,000 off of a third of an acre. That's awesome. But I don't think that you should strive for that in year one. And I think that year one, it's really, what you're striving for is learning how to grow and building relationships. And if you can make money, that's awesome. And the more time that you can afford to invest in building your knowledge capital and your social capital, the better it's going to be 
when things take off. And, 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 and I can't stress that enough, you know. The farmers who are doing the best that I know have had a period of apprenticeship and then a period of development of their business and then a period where now I'm going to do, this is the best way to do it and I'm gonna develop my whole system around this. And, um, and you can't jump into that third period without going through the first. And you think maybe, you might think that you can and maybe it looks like you're doing it, but sometimes the worst thing that can happen is they have a great first year because then you start to do more of the same, but it was not the best thing to do. And you dig yourself a hole that takes you five or six years to admit that you were just lucky at the beginning. So, um, and, and this comes back a lot to, you know, um, that, that those first slides about how much you need to put in your pocket. And if you need $10,000 to put in your pocket, don't grow $80,000 a crop. Grow $20,000 a crop, you know? And, and so if you want to start, start small. Figure it out and do better. The worst thing to do is I want to have 100 CSA shares. Mathematically, it fits on an acre. I'm growing two acres of crop because two acres of crop have to be plant, started, planted, weeded. If you lose control, your harvest yield numbers are going to be lower than if you just had an acre of crop. So, so start small. Figure out how it happens. If you want to scale up, know why you're scaling up and make that decision. Don't scale up by accident. And if you want to stay small, well, then just do it better, you know? And um, so it's really that time to build. And, and I guess I would bring an analogy back to our seed business. Um, there's a great market for seeds. We've been in it for about 10 years. The last two or three years is where it's starting to really have an impact on our, on our numbers. It's always been profitable, but we've never really been pushing it. And we've always been very afraid to push it because, um, so you do need to have quality, uh, quality product, and that's important. And if you don't have quality product, you probably shouldn't be selling it. But you also have to need to have great customer service. And great customer service can be hard to maintain when, when orders go crazy and when your system's crashing. So we've just grown it as in function of the need, we're n and we're not doing a lot of promotion. And we can afford to do that because we have a vegetable business that works well. And I mean, most of us worked three to five years in other vegetable farms and ran other vegetable farms before we started our farm together. So when we started in, we did 110 shares our first year in two farmers markets. And I would not recommend that to anybody, <laughs> but we did very well. And the toughest part for us was being friendly to one another. And when you're five people working together, it's and you're running a business, it's, it's so easy to snap at each other, and it, 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 it's tough on, on social relationships. Um, so, but we had, the, we had the agricultural experience, so we took off. We're doing so much better, both in terms of community and in terms of business at this point, and we're still friends. We're better friends than we were at that point. Um, so, yeah, so that, 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 take the time to build. Um, yeah. So, how to decide what crops to grow? Whose question was that? Are they still here? Okay. Um, how would you guys decide what crops to grow? After we've gone through this and you guys have seen other presentations by other people? What do you like to grow first? What do you like to grow? That, that can't be stressed enough. If you hate working in a greenhouse and all your crops are transplanted, you're going to be working in a greenhouse a lot. You know? that, that, that really, what you like to grow, if you love growing potatoes, maybe starting a microgreen operation is not the way to do it. Um, so, so that, that, that's totally true. What are other things? What will grow in your climate. Yes, what will grow in your climate. And that is something that, like, so we're at a permaculture con uh, uh, event, and, you know, we talk about context all the time, and context is important for, for your, your crop choice. And, you know, across the states and across Canada, you have climates that rain tons in the summer, and some that don't rain at all. Some that might be in the, the, well, the high hundreds, the low hundreds, and some that might barely get, it's like 85 or 90 degrees in the summer. And so that really has an impact. And if you can crop year round, um, you might want to have a lower sales volume, but have a longer season, as opposed to trying to maintain a big sales volume and then a lower one. Uh, a, a small one. So there's, that, that's really true. Other things? Demand in your area. Demand in your area. Um, and that is, 
that's a tricky one because when you know there's a demand for something, it's probably because people are asking for it, and it's possible there's people there who are meeting part of that demand. And so when you jump into that kind of context, you're jumping in with competition. It's really great to meet unmet demands, and unmet demands that you can do better than people who aren't doing it, or you're the only person to do it. And that's something to really look at, because if you're competing with people, um, it's going to reduce for everybody. And, um, uh, and it is fantastic to come in as the first of something in a market and get your name, and then everybody else can be a copy of you. Um, but, 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 but if you can't sell something, yeah. it's not always, you're not always going to be proud to be the first. <laughs> so. like if you guys tried anything that maybe people, was it, like I know recently there's a guy near me that just started growing a lot of ginger. Yeah. Because apparently the, the, you could sell ginger for quite a bit based on market research and stuff. Like yeah, though the, co the, the production costs are higher than people sometimes realize. I mean, in our case, one of the things that we have is we grow garlic, as I was mentioning. And this came out of a personal interest of mine and had a dozen varieties. We were growing them early on. We started a garlic festival at our farmer's market, and we just kept selling out. So we just kept raising our prices and growing more. And at this point, you know, at the, like... We are, the, we are the key stall at this garlic festival, and we have the most diversity. And when we go to other garlic festivals too, you know, people have one or two crops, it's hard for them to compete with us. We have you know, 12 different strains, we have nice packaging, um, and then we have promotional material, we have educational material. So, um, I mean, garlic's not that weird, as opposed to like ginger, but it's something that came out of an interest, and it's the diversity and the and education that, that, that really strengthened that. Um, and so just a couple other things is looking at that crop profitability, you know, is a good way to choose crops. And it's in function, that crop profitability based on what you can sell is really important. And then the kind of technology that you have. If you love taking apart tractors and rebuilding them, and that's why you're farming, you want to grow crops that grow well with tractors. And maybe microgreens is not what you're doing. But if you don't have that penchant, then you choose something in function of what you want to do. Um, yeah. So how to imp improvise a well-structured crop plan? Um, and we talked about that a bit with the crop plan and the, the, the plan monitor control replan. Um, farming is all about improvising. It's what you're doing all the time. And... Um, Improvising, the best improvising comes from mastering your craft and knowing what you can do. And then when things happen, you can change and adapt to them. Improvising doesn't mean come in with no plant plans, throw seeds in the ground, maybe have tools on hand and try to do something. I mean, that's, that's a lot of improvising, but it's, that's kind of just, it's a mess. And so like really good improvising comes from being a master of your craft and a master of your plan and recognizing that your plan's gonna be wrong. That's the first thing is your plan will be wrong, um, hopefully not all wrong, and being able to assess when it's wrong and change it. Um, and it's kind of as simple as that. And in some ways, the way to have, another way to answer this question is how to make your crop plan succeed the most. Um, so often talking about improvise is trying to deal where it's gone wrong, but how can you make it the most precise? And a lot of that is to come down to really good systems is to understand how long it takes for them to mature. Recognize that maybe broccoli takes, and that's not a really good example, but maybe something like radishes you can get in three weeks in the middle of the summer, but in the spring, it's four or five weeks that it's taking. And in the late fall, the same kind of thing. And if you understand that, you start to plan around it. If you don't know that yet, you have to improvise because you planned around three weeks and you thought you'd have a basket in mid-May and you have nothing. Um, so, um, it's figuring out your systems so they're reliable and knowing when you have to plant stuff and getting your weeds under control. And those are the big things. The biggest thing to improvise with that you can't deal with is probably weather. And that's something to, um, the longer, if you, if you are a celery act farmer or something, a rutabaga farmer, and you grow things early and you have them in the field all, all, all summer and then you, have it, you take them at the end and you have a horrible... Uh, like crazy hail or something, and it destroys the plants and get disease and die, you're just not going to have... Your improvisation 
is going to be change your kind of crop. But if you have stuff that's in the ground for five or six weeks, then if you lose something, and like a worst case scenario, you lose all your crop, but it's all five week days to maturity, you got some good relationship building opportunity there, but you can just plant and five weeks later you're back in business. So that's part of the whole, the whole system. And that's why having a diversity of markets and or diversity of crops can, can be, can, can, kind of reinforces itself. Um, yeah. And do certain crops lend themselves to small farms and low infrastructure? I would say that these two things are not the same thing. And I kind of highlighted it, this, like when I talk about if you don't have a cold room, a small, being a very small farm is going to be tough because the crops that are best on a small farm are your salad greens, your herbs, bunched greens, which all benefit tremendously from, from, from cold storage. Now, if you were a medium or large farm and you're doing a lot of potatoes and carrots and beets, if you're harvesting them later in the season, maybe you can get them into an area that's a bit cooler and it, you can work through it, or maybe you can deliver them the next day. Like, but, that's, but I would say that these two... Low infrastructure, it depends what the infrastructure is. And you've got to be appropriate infrastructure for a small farm. And, I, and we talked about that at the beginning, what that, what that might be. So um, we're hitting almost noon. Um, maybe if there was one or two pressing questions, we could wrap that up and then, uh, and then finish and go have lunch. Can we repeat that, please? I'm cleaning garlic with a toothbrush. <laughs> I'm cleaning garlic with a toothbrush, yes. Is that the comment or is that the question? <laughs> um, yeah, so we, are cl we do clean garlic with a toothbrush. What kind of soil do you have? Um, we have a sandy loam soil. And so this is garlic that's been, um, that's been cured before we're going to clean from the toothbrush. And where we started cleaning from the toothbrush is after reading um, Growing Great Garlic by, what's his name, Ron England, I think, from Fillory Farm. They clean their, their garlic with a toothbrush. So we started doing it. And... Um, uh, and you can get stuff fantastic looking, but there's kind of a balance of, if stuff is dry enough, a few good flicks gets it fairly clean. And what we're looking for is clean enough. We're not looking for shiny, pristine. And um, if you can get it clean enough, that's good. And part of it is, if you have a heavy clay soil, this might not work for you. But most soil types, it could work. The other thing is, sometimes, if you don't cure your garlic long enough, and you bring it into an area that's a little bit humid, you start to have black mold that forms on it. That's really hard to clean off with a toothbrush. You start having to take an extra layer off. So it's kind of getting to a good dry point that'll let that, let that work. Yeah. A last question? When you brush your teeth, does it taste like garlic? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> like her too. Yeah. any other last comments? Let's <laughs> be the last question then. Yeah, and I'll just draw a picture to, to take us out with. When we talk about our beds, so we have the growing space, and then we have the walking space, and the way we measure is from the middle of one walking space to the middle of the other walking space. And in our case, we have a tractor, so the wheels go here, and that's what sets our space at five foot because it's five foot from center of tractor wheel, center of tractor wheel. And it's about 30 feet growing space on the top, very similar to what Jean-Martin has. So our farm looks a lot like his, except not as dense and bigger, bigger paths. But the growing space is kind of similar. Um, and if you were designing around humans, this space can be shorter. And that's how you'd have it more narrow. Um, but if you wanted to have certain wheelbarrows come down, make sure that they fit in whatever space you have. So on that, um, thank you very much, and uh, bon appétit. So. <laughs>